Hello, this is Silas. I'm back for another conversation with my friend Steven. Say what's up. Hello, everyone. And this will be a discussion of repressive tolerance by Herbert Marcuse. I might be saying that name wrong, but I'll kick it to Herbert Steven. Marcuse, that's right. Uh, Marcuse. Marcuse or Marcuse? Mar Marcuse. Here's that Mar Marcuse. <laughs> It's it's a little bit I guess it's not a hard Z sound but it's a little yeah. more like that because in German the double S would be a S and the single S would be like Z, like Z so yeah it's a little more okay so Marcuse Marcuse yeah Marcuse yeah. <laughs> excuse us if we go back and forth we tolerate our, <laughs> our lack of of saying the name right but uh, let's get into that now Stephen let us know about uh, this text and what we're going to be reading here. Sure. So this this essay was written by Herbert Marcuse. He was a German intellectual from the. He was one of the major figures in the Frankfurt School. For those of us who those of you who watched the series on cynical theories, we talked about it a bit in there as well as elsewhere. That was that it was known originally as the Institute for Social Research, founded in Frankfurt, Germany. The goal was basically to figure out why Marxism didn't take off in the West. So they delved deep into culture as well as psychology to try and understand it and. They wanted to basically figure out, okay, why didn't the proletariat embrace Marxism and lead the uprising against the bourgeoisie and create the Marxist utopia? Now, the Frankfurt School was originally, it went through a few different phases. It was founded early 1920s. Then, of course, when Hitler came to power, the thinkers being Marxist and Jewish had to flee to the U.S. So uh, several stayed here, including Marcuse, but then several others went back and reopened it again. So it went through kind of a few phases. And of course, the thinkers themselves went through different phases as well. Uh, of course, uh, Marcuse was a big figure here in the, U in the U.S. He was known as the father of the new left, actually. He mentored Angela Davis. Angela Davis said he, well, he radicalized her and taught her both how to be a scholar and an activist. And if I recall correctly, I think he also helped organize Vietnam protests. So he's one of those figures that's interesting because you don't a lot, not a lot of people know who he is mainstream wise, but but he had a huge impact. Like he had, yeah. I mean, if you bring up Angela Davis to a lot of people, they'll know who that is. And if you know who she is, you should definitely know who Marcuse was. <laughs> you should, but chances are you don't, and that's yeah. that's part of the key of this. And yeah. I've been hearing about this for some time, mm -hmm. and I wasn't too familiar with Marcuse for a while. I just say Herbert. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I wasn't too familiar with him, but I was familiar with the his disciples, <clears throat> his acolytes, the people who were inspired by him. The the dis anything disciples is works as well as not the people who he inspired. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure he's written a lot of other texts and things like this, but this key one has been very significant. And I finally got around to reading it a few on last week and recording this on a Wednesday, Wednesday, March third. I recorded it and I have an audio version of it out where it's just a straight read. And in that read, I said, this is going to be the discussion for it. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I do suggest you take a pause now and there will be a link somewhere on wherever you're listening to this to the actual text read through. It's about an hour and a half. If you put it on 1.5, two times speed, you can be back in 45 minutes <laughs> and then listen to the rest of this. Because in this one, we're going to be discussing aspects of it, and I took certain excerpts, and we'll be breaking down and having more conversation and diving deeper into breaking down <clears throat> what, what we think about this. For me, that was my first read. Stephen, when was the first time you found this or you actually read this text? I'm trying to think now. I think it's been – I'm trying to remember if it was a few years ago. Like I don't remember exactly where I heard about it, but it's one of those things that sort of come up in recent memory because – we talk a lot about what we call leftist hypocrisy, where people on the political left will excuse certain violence, dishonesty, and other things when their side does it, but then be all over right-wing and libertarian types when they do it. And on the surface, <clears throat> it comes across as hypocrisy, but if you read this essay, it gives you good insight into why they behave this way, because the reason is that – they're coming at this from the angle of people on the left are the oppressed, people on the right are the oppressors. So the idea is because we're oppressors, we're oppressed people fighting against an oppressive system, we have a right to act out in this way. So there's a certain asymmetry, which, for, again, from an outside perspective, it's, oh, they're being hypocritical. But if you understand the logic of this essay, you, you get, okay, this is where they're coming from and why. Now, the what's a little absurd, at least to me, and I'm sure others, is that when, when Marcuse wrote this essay, it made a little more sense because he wrote it in the early civil rights movement and all that. So, you you know, police were sticking 
fire hoses and attack dogs on black people. The Klan had a resurgence. Like, all of this made sense. But now, I mean, you know, we, we've said it several times now, but if you think about it, like, you know, when George Floyd was killed, you see BLM stuff everywhere. All the corporate people support it. Hollywood supports it. Academia supports it. They've raised billions in dollars. So it's, you know, if, if these people are oppressed, it's like I'm not seeing it. So, again, looking at it from in fairness to Marcusa, looking at it through the lens of his time period, it made a little more sense. But now you're looking at it, it's kind of like you guys are the establishment. You're not the oppressed people. <laughs> and there is something here to also think about where we're talking about the things that you know versus the things you can know. Yeah. It makes sense why you haven't heard of Harbert Marcuse or read Repressive Tolerance or heard about it, because that's just the way things have been. That was before the information age, even when Marcuse was writing these things and coming to the, the understandings that he had. And when I was reading this text, like has happened with many things, I'm reading it and this sounds sensible with the information that's there. He sounds like a reasonable person, but he did not have close to as much access to information that if you're listening to this, you have. Because you could stop listening to this and you could go and listen to all these other things and get information about all these other sources that Marcuse lacked when he was coming to his thoughts and ideas. Like yeah. uh, Stephen mentioned with the George Floyd thing, right now the court case is coming up in Minnesota. They're getting different kind of <laughs> levels of, K of cages for their, for their <laughs> sometimes violent, mostly peaceful protests that are likely to explode during this thing. You have people who are saying, oh, we're certain this, it, was, it was a clear murder. I watched a clear murder on the screen. No, no, you didn't. You did not watch a clear murder on the screen because that's not what happened on, on the TV. Like, it's nothing was clear there, but he was following actual laws. You could actually go in and see the actual laws that the Minnesota uh, police people have. You can actually watch multiple different film of it. You can see George Floyd saying, I can't breathe from before it. You can start asking these questions. You can go in and see what are the laws. If it's second degree manslaughter, what does that mean? Have you seen these people who've been collecting different sorts of evidence? You can get that information to kind of get a better idea of what's probably going to happen in this court case. But on the other hand, you can just be like the Minnesota the Minnesota government said they were going to hire they were going to hire influencers. They were going to have like a budget of twelve thousand dollars to get four uh, very popular Minnesota influencers and pay them or social media influencers to send out certain messaging to the people. <laughs> but in, in one hand, you think, okay, that's kind of ridiculous that you're trying to you're trying to make sense out of you're trying to make sense to people who would listen to to uh, influencers. What kind of person, what kind of message could you send to somebody who would rather listen to an influencer rather than go online and actually read the actual laws and things like that? They're not going to listen to the influencers. They want to be angry for other reasons. So right now, if you're in a position, you feel like the, the country's ending. Oh, the left has taken over. Or these people seem so insane. These people seem so crazy. What, what are they doing? You can actually go in and read their belief systems, read their dogma understand where they're coming from so you can identify who's actually on this, who actually knows what they're coming from, why can I expect this from them, versus going back to the times when we had warring clans and warring religions where the people who had the religion themselves, they couldn't read the language their books were written in, or they were limited to some few groups of people in some high elite priestly class, or let alone the, the religion or the faith or the belief system or the ideologies of the people who are your opponents. And that was different. You were living, your opponents were living across the ocean. They had to come across your borders. Now people are living among each other. So people need to understand, if you're on the left and you follow some of these <clears> ideologies, <throat> please read Oppressive Tolerance and see exactly what Marcuse was talking about. If you're on the political right, if you're on the conservative and you feel you're assailed by this, please also read Oppressive Tolerance and actually get to understand where these people are coming from and what you agree with, what you disagree with, because that's a better way to actually come to an understanding, come past that information age to the age of understanding. And just like you said, I started off with the George Floyd thing. When you get the actual information on it, when you get to realize that <clears throat> these things can happen, George Floyd was one individual that, that happened to pass away in a very unfortunate way. For me, the bigger issue is why is a 50-something-year-old out in not employed in the situation that he had with the fentanyl, trying to trying to take a counterfeit bill. What was that whole situation? And that's more the sociopolitical issues that existed with a shutdown and things like that to get him in that situation where he was in those dire straits to be in that position. To me, that's a bigger issue than what actually happened. But what actually happened was one out of possibly 
the way it's been going with the numbers dropping down in in black people dying unarmed black people dying in in involved with policemen and this wasn't a shooting that's a trick just involved in interactions with policemen it's under 20 a year over the last couple of years yeah most people some people would probably think it's hundreds or I, they saw this this recent uh, test done it was only 1005 people sampled but it was like about um, I think they went from very liberal to very conservative on the, uh, and going to, yeah. going between like liberal conservative then just moderate. But about a hundred people thought it was over ten thousand people. That yeah. is that is <laughs> is a big discrepancy from the reality yeah. of the, the way things are. But at the same point, that one person can lead to how many billions of dollars of damage was involved in that? How many things I now? I have to look it up. Um, yeah. Yeah, now they're going to tie in what happened on January 6th and watch it. The government is not going to want these kind of things to continue. So they'll use the January 6th thing as an excuse to start bringing in some draconian anti-protest events. And yes, most of them were mostly peaceful. Just like on January 6th, 99% of the people who were involved in that were peaceful and did not enter the Capitol building. But that will be taken as a way to bring down that hammer, to bring down that fist on people who have actual, actual reasons to be out in the streets and to protest. And that will be used because we're, uh, we're taking from that one person, all these things can happen. And in a similar way, from what Mercuza said, all these people can be activists, all these people can be activated. And you personally out there, you could be the person who can read Mercuza and maybe get to the point where you're like, okay, I see something in this that, might, that people might be getting wrong. That if you understand it and if you read it and you communicate it to somebody else or you talk to somebody else, you might be the person who talks the person out of the ledge who makes more sense out of what Marcuse said here, and that leads to more understanding, that leads to a more equitable, and I think equitable is still a decent word to use, <laughs> lead to a more peaceful and, and effective way of actually continuing this human flourishing that civilization is actually creating versus going through these kind of destructive means that, and applications that I think this content has been, has been applied to. Yeah. Sure. So just a few points before we move on. Um, what you said about reading thing, reading information and understanding it and being able to understand the opponents. I brought it up a few times, but I always think of the medieval Catholic Church with the Bible in Latin and how they only wanted the priest to be able to understand it. And remember, before Luther translated into German, other people who tried to do that were killed for it. So it makes you wonder, what are they hiding? Like, why are you afraid of the people understanding their own text? It makes you wonder, what are you hiding? Whereas with this stuff, I mean, I always encourage people to read Man, Economy, and State. We're going to do a series on human action soon. I want more people to read it. I'm not shielding it because I'm embarrassed about what's in it and I'm using it to manipulate people. You know, it just it makes you wonder if people don't want you to know the material, what are you hiding? And then a few other points here, too. Um, so Marcuse, like I mentioned, fled the Nazis. And uh, I'm trying to remember if he went he went to the U.S. If it was NYU at first, and then ultimately he ended up in California. Uh, so, of course, he was very anti-fascism, of course, being Jewish. He wasn't he wouldn't have survived under Nazism. And he was actually responsible for some of the uh, anti-fascism laws in Germany after the war. And. One of the problems, though, and you and I talked a little bit about this via messenger before this conversation, is um, it's not it's not clear, though, what they define as fascism, because, of course, you know, we, we would talk about the alliance between corporation and state, and that's what Mussolini himself said. But for these people, fascism seems to be anything to the right of Bernie Sanders, basically. Like, in East Germany, Angela Davis is, or, you know, or at least was, I don't know if she still is, a... Uh, a big fan of um, East Germany, and she talked about how uh, the people who were protesting the government there, who were who were arrested, she said, "Well, they were basically they're fascists. They deserve it." But this is the same woman who railed against black people being incarcerated here. So it's like, you know, what they do is they frame everything as this is fascism. That way, we can be violent or imprison these people or whatever. And you know, in this essay and elsewhere, I don't think he's given a clear definition of fascism. Again, we'll get into the essay itself, but. If I remember correctly, um, what it was is that because they were worried about fascism emerging in the U.S. the way they had in Germany, it was sort of – it's sort of – you could argue a misreading of the paradox of tolerance, but basically the idea that if we don't nip fascism in the bud, as it were, it's going to take over and then it's going to be unstoppable. So – in order to do that, we have to crack down on anything that could sort of be the seeds of fascism. Now, again, they don't seem to give a clear definition of what those things are, but – you know, if if you are a Marxist, as these people are, 
even democratic protesters in East Germany are a threat because they see it as, well, this person could go back to a liberal democracy that has its in inequity, all that, and then that could pave the way for fascism yet again. That's sort of the angle they're coming from. Again, I disagree with that for a whole mess of reasons, but that's sort of the angle that they're trying to argue from. Yeah. yeah. And that's key because there are some people on the democratic side who say, oh, it's, our democracy is safe now that Joe Biden is in that will be quite surprised when the activists, some of the people in the further to the left, continue. And then arguably, we've, we've been talking about that, how it, it, the corporatist kind of, it, it is kind of fascist in, in the sense where they want public sector controlling the private sector. They want a, a, they want a monopolistic private sector that is sociopolitically loyal to the public sector that is in their control. So they have that kind of system that is kind of neo-fascistic, if I would say. I'm trying to think of a term to kind of explain what's, what's going on in there. And you have to realize that to them, you still are, it's not really about democracy. When they talk about a liberal democracy in the classic sense of liberal or just democracy in general, as you'll see as we get into discussions or as you've heard, if you've actually now hopefully listened to the repressive tolerance, um, he's talking about how democracy itself, it's not the kind of society and culture that, that exists. So they're not happy with the way it is. They're not happy with just Trump being out. No. Trump was part of was this part of it. They also want Biden out. Like that's why you even I think it was just it was uh, I think it was before the inauguration. But there was still some Antifa Antifa um, activities up in Washington. And interesting mm -hmm. enough, we, we, as we get into this, this itself was something that was annotated. And this the version that I read here, which I took from the PDF and the website, there will be a link to that too. And there was also a link on the on the reading was actually annotated or by somebody who was going to Evergreen State University, Evergreen State College, and that's in Olympia, Washington. That's the same place that um, Dr. Brett Weinstein was yeah. in with Heather Haying that we've yeah. talked about in previous series. And we talked about how that was a specific place. That university was, if there's a bell curve, it was on the far fringe of the, of the cathedral going to the direction that it has, where most colleges aren't really that involved. But this guy was a musician, a composer, and he decided to bring this in from the actual text version that was a scan of the actual document or the 160, 137 page document or something, 123 page book that was published in 1965. I don't even know how many of those exist. Then Marcuse himself, his story coming out and going to Switzerland and coming to the United States, he could have easily been caught up in the German rise of the, the war mark and just been killed off and we wouldn't have had this. Or he could have just not managed to start the Frankfurt School. Or he might have just decided uh, okay, you're asking me to write the third part of this critique of pure tolerance. Uh, maybe I have something else to do, and this wouldn't be there. But through all those processes, and still, it actually made it there. The actual documents existed. This person at uh, at uh, Evergreen State College, with his whatever issues that he had, he might have been involved with some of the people who decided to have that takeover of the school where I knocked it on the national stage. And then he could have decided he could have been caught up in that. I don't know when he did this. It originally posted in 2003, so I'm not quite sure. I don't remember the date of the actual uprising in Evergreen College, Evergreen State. But if, let's say, that uprising had happened, it definitely wasn't 2003. It was much after that. Yeah. So if it happened in 2001 and the school had shut down, then he might not have actually been able to write this and I wouldn't be able to actually find it. So there's all these things and all these connections, these interesting stories that we work in. But that's, a, that's one of the positive things that, that happened with the world today. I think with one thing I noticed with the Constitution of the United States of America and uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and th those those things that are in there, the, the first the First Amendment where it says the right, the freedom of the press. To me, it's it's been turned into the press, like the media, the news media, the newspapers. But I think it's the press in the general of an actual printing press, the ability to put your words down and disseminate your words and ideas. That is something that is very, very new. It's very exceptional in the history of man. It used to be like there was one book. If you wrote a book, you'd have to write each book over and over again, getting the paper, getting the ability to do it, to keep it. It was like, okay, we're keeping this one book, then we have to annotate it, the whole thing. We have to write it down again by hand. But then the printing press came out, and you had the ability to spread your ideas and spread your thoughts. And now we have the internet where you can just record things. You can <laughs> get different ones. You can just copy and paste and send things around. And this spread of information is a positive thing. And I'm also just curious, what would Marcuse have thought, what would he have written if he lived today and he had access to the sort of information that we have today? I don't think he would have wrote exactly the same kind of paper. I no. think there would have been some things that he adjusts, but I think when we get into that in this discussion, there might be some parts where that comes up. 
By the way, it's pronounced Wehrmacht. 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 See? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know a little German. I'm not great, but I know a bit yeah. trying to... <laughs> Wehrmacht. Okay. So uh, with this one, the way I did it was when I was listening through, I, I was like halfway through and I was like, okay, I started taking out some excerpts from the actual version. And there's, there's a print version. I mean, there's a regular web, web, web page version with a full scroll. There'll be a link to that. And then there's a special one where it's a, he took the scan of the PDF and then he put it into a 12-page PDF version. And that's the one that I'm going to uh, be using for taking out the excerpts and breaking them down and discussing those parts. And with that one, I'll be taking an excerpt, maybe two from the few to the end, of, uh, from each page of this document. So that's, sure. that's about, it's, it's, it was 11 pages that I took different excerpts from. So I'll just be reading, I'll read the excerpt and then uh, we can go into discussing that, that part. Sure. Okay. So page one, this is just the opening part of it. This essay examines the idea of tolerance in our advanced industrial society. The conclusion reached is that the realization of the objective of tolerance would call for intolerance towards prevailing policies, attitudes, opinions, and the extension of tolerance to policies, attitudes, and opinions which are outlawed or suppressed. In other words, today tolerance appears again as what it was in its origins at the beginning of the modern period. A partisan uh, goal, a subversive liberating uh, notion and practice. Conversely, what is proclaimed and practiced as tolerance today is in many of its most effective manifestations serving the cause of oppression. The author is fully aware that at present, no power, no authority, no government exists, which would translate liberating tolerance into practice. But he believes that it is the task and the duty of the intellectual to recall and preserve historical possibilities, which seem to have be become utopian possibilities. This is the task to break, no, this is his task, no, that it is his task to break the concreteness of oppression in order to open the mental space in which this society can be recognized as what it is and does. Mm. Yeah. So as I've mentioned before, I would argue it's a misreading of the paradox of tolerance by Karl Popper, basically the idea that if we allow toler unfettered tolerance, certain intolerant factions will rise and then if they gain power, we'll lose tolerance. So it's sort of that paradox of, okay, you don't want to become oppressive. It's a whole Nietzsche thing about you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. You don't want to become oppressive in the name of cracking down on intolerant things, but at the same time, we have to do something. So uh, what Popper basically argued, there's a dishonest infographic going around about it, but my understanding was that what Popper truly believed was you can, you know, we have to try and reason people out of bad ideas. Now, force is only acceptable if either the people themselves have completely abandoned rational discourse if they're preventing people from preventing their own followers from engaging in rational discourse or they themselves become violent. So the example I thought of for this would be like if, let's say, the Klan or a group of neo-Nazis were to take over a town and cut off outside communications. Yeah, you, violence would be OK in that because they're using violence and they're depriving other people of their rights. But if they just walk down the streets waving flags and stuff, I mean, they're not doing anything. Yeah, they're an evil group, but they have a right to do that. But Marcuse either misread this or he took the idea to a much more extreme of, OK, if there are any seeds of intolerance at all, we have to stamp them out before they can even come to fruition and you will get into it later in the essay but there's some things where he hints at what he would do to make that happen yeah and i think one key thing is he's talking about tolerance in an advanced industrial society yeah which that's after the industrial age so yeah. i think we should keep that in mind as we're discussing some of these things he's not just going into don't start talking about like you know, like don't say like much tribe and antiquity type of thing like yeah. oh so should i be tolerant if we're just in in some state of nature type of situation where we're like in some abandoned like uncontacted tribe in that no okay those people who when they went to the beach and they're just like throwing spears back at the humans because they'd never actually seen any other humans outside their tribe no those are intolerant people like they work yeah. in a different kind of <laughs> calculus yeah. there and one thing I was wondering on, I, was Marcuse religi re, ah, religious? Is he Christian or anything? No, he, well, he was Jewish, remember, but he was, a, yeah, being that he was Marxist, as far as I know, he was an atheist. He was, you know, a Jew turned Marxist okay. slash atheist. Because, like, I'm wondering how would this apply and, and fall into the, the Bronze Age, the Abrahamic Bronze Age religions? Because that wasn't an industrial society. So what by writing this, it does, is this kind of giving some out? or something? Well, okay. well, That's why those... 
can be unethically intolerant as they are because they're outside of an industrial society. So those those level it doesn't really apply to repressive tolerance or this the talk of tolerance that we're going through here because that's a different world. Yeah, yeah. Let me elaborate on that for a sec because think of what Marx wrote about how society progresses, how we had barbarism, then feudalism, then capitalism and socialism. There's that clear progression. It was a similar thing here, I think, because remember, he was a Marxist originally, Marcuse. So it's the idea of, OK, we have tribes then we have feudalism, then we have the bourgeoisie and all that. But now, OK, what is the next stage beyond that? And the idea is that because the bourgeoisie are being Frankfurt school, he's looking at this through the lens of culture because the white male, whatever oppressors are holding other people down what is the next stage of evolution? And he'll get to this later in the essay, but he talks about creating an ideal democracy. And the idea is that, okay, things are oppressive as they are, but this is only a, sta a necessary stage on the way to development. And remember, Marx himself had a similar view of capitalism that, you know, you know, he obviously, socialism was his ideal, the utopia, but the idea of that, okay, capitalism is a necessary stage to this. And I think Marcuse had a very similar attitude, like, you know, we have all this wealth and everything, and that's great, but it's not our final form, as it were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So pretty much the religion, he didn't really, because he, he didn't really mention it that much in this entire document. No. It's, it seems strange, but I guess that's also part of why that, that's part of why I think this is, it's, it's a child. It's part of, in, in the sense, the West, I don't think United States of America in specific is a, is a Christian, is a Judeo-Christian country, but the people in it, are of Judeo-Christian and yeah. Islamic, to a sense, faith. So that Abrahamic type of ideology, that type of way of looking at the world, has continued in its philosophy. And I think philosophy came from places, sociology, these things, economics. They used to be all part and parcel of religion. So once we got to a point where we had enough, enough wealth, enough safety, enough free time to actually break these apart into their own things, politics and sociology and economics, and you can have these things separate where somebody can be really well-versed in economics and know nothing about politics, or very good at sociology, know nothing about the sciences, when before you had to be this kind of renaissance man, this whole kind of person. But but now you had those spe these spe specialities, and I think that's how it went. Theology now was broken off into its own field where that had its own thing, but these that same kind of Abrahamic type of faith system is part of what this has taken. And to some people, this has become a sort of religion where they just believe these things and they don't actually read the actual original text. And I think this is, to me, reading this and listening to this was one of the first ones like, okay, this is part of the core text. Like if you're talking about, this is kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls type of things of what the progressive, regressive leftist movement is in the United States of America right now, like critical race theory, or critical theory, uh, even postmodernism to an extent. It's There's a lot of stuff in here that's, that it really it really meshes those things together, I think. Well, I was going to say, I was listening to a good video. There was a, an objectivist type guy I used to follow on YouTube, and he was talking about philosophy and the relationship with psychology. And he was saying that how, you know, as these things become better and better understood, they're integrated. The idea is that, okay, we can use philosophy to that, you know, that developed science. I mean, science was born out of Aristotle's metaphysics and epistemology. And then as we understand science better, we, you know, and we we have a good philosophy for life, ethics, epistemology, all that. The two can kind of become integrated. But we're at the point now where all these things with evolutionary psychology and everything, there's a lot about the brain we don't know. I mean, it's one of the youngest disciplines. So it's there's still a lot of stuff we don't know and we're still learning. So they're not integrated yet. I mean, ideally they will be, but I think we're working towards that point. Yeah. 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 Like I think I, I may take some time to go back in and uh, although I was just suggested somebody just suggested we're, we're starting the, the human action series and then somebody just suggested um, I think there's something the, the world as it is or something it's a collection of of, of uh, stories or short short writings by Murray Rothbard I so I just bookmarked that but uh -huh. I might find time to go back and read the rest of this critique of pure tolerance uh, the parts by Robert Wolf, which is Beyond Tolerance and Barrington Moore Jr. which is Tolerance and the Scientific Outlook I'm it's interested to see did they did they also become bigger names? What 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 effect did they have? If you know at all, uh, I'm not familiar with, as familiar with them. I mean, I've seen them cited, but I didn't delve deep into. Yeah, you see, that's the thing. Like, how many people? Like, who was inspiring Marcuse? So yeah. it's like these people might have been inspiring him. He might have it took some of these ideas, or was he the shining star? Like, um, so these these are kind of the interesting things to kind of think about. Why does some person? Why does it? Why does this stick out after these three parts? Well, like I mentioned in the other series, I mean, the, again, the big deal with Marcusa is that he mentored Angela Davis. Angela Davis is one of Kimberly Crenshaw's mentors. She with Derek Bell, they came up with critical race theory and intersectionality. That's taught 
pretty much mainstream at universities now. So again, if you, if you know what intersectionality is, you should know who Crenshaw is. If you know who Crenshaw is, you should know who Davis is. If you know Davis, you should know Marcusa. Again, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly no leftist as anyone who talks to me knows, but I do know who these people were and I have an idea of what they believed. And if, if you're all about these ideas, you should at least have some idea. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. It's like, yeah. why is Jordan Peterson big? Why does yeah. Stefan Molyneux hit it big? Why does, why does Ben Shapiro hit it big? Why do some of these people hit it big, but then there's other channels that are just not listening? Like, if Makuza had been living now and come up now, and he was like, let's say he was 50 now and he's just starting to write this, maybe he'd just have a YouTube channel with, like, enough people to support him to keep making videos and not really yeah. have that many people, and he would never have really been inspired enough to actually touch as many people. And that's what I said at the end of the reading of Impressive Tolerance, because he mentioned some people that were being persecuted. And why did those particular people, out of all the other heathens at that time, happen to be the ones that actually were in the position to be under the Pope's eye, to actually feel like, okay, we got to persecute this person and make an example out of him? You just happen to be in the right time, the right place. Whereas it's the same thing with Marcuse, where now he might have just been one of the many voices out there. So you might be the, you might be the person to listen to this, be that next voice to put that actual effect that's similar to what Marcuse did. Or he might just be living in a different time. I don't know. Well, I was thinking of that, you know, it was recently Murray Rothbard's birthday and like they wondered about if he were still alive or if the Internet had started earlier because how much stuff yeah. he wrote. And he, you know, he's not you wouldn't say he's mainstream, but he built up a big following, especially Ron Paul and that whole thing. So if he had the Internet, and his stuff was everywhere. I mean, who knows? He might be a household name or something. It's just back then you could get his you could buy his books, maybe then they were made free Mises online. And of course, you know, the Mises Institute is is one of the smaller think tanks relative to some others. So that's why it doesn't have as much it's not part of the cathedral as it were but again if he had started earlier and he had really caught on i mean who knows it could that could be a serious mainstream movement now yeah this is a time travel thing okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. After that. okay back into the actual thing okay now the excerpt from the second page okay limits cannot be defined in terms of the respective society in other words tolerance is an end in and of itself when it's true when it is truly universal practiced by the rulers as well as the ruled by the lords as well as the peasants, by the sheriffs as well as their victims. And when universal tolerance is possible, only when, no, and such universal tolerance is possible only when no real or alleged enemy requires the, in the national interest the education and training of people in military violence and destruction. As long as these conditions do not prevail, the conditions of tolerance are loaded. They are determined and defined by the institutionalized inequality, which is certainly compatible with constitutional inequality, i.e., by the class, no, i.e., by the class uh, structure of society. In such a society, tolerance is de facto limited to the dual ground of legalized voices or suppression, police, armed forces, guards of all sorts, and of the privileged position held by the predominant interests and their connections. That's it. So I think that's kind of interesting because there's a certain part of that, that like being libertarian minded, I would agree with how the police are agents of the state and the ruling class and all that. But at the same time, and again, like I say, during the time period he was writing it, it made sense because you had all these protests, you had all these, you know, you had again the riots, all that. Well, the riots actually occurred a bit after this, but you know, so like it made sense the civil rights movement, of course, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King getting assassinated and all that. So looking at it through that lens, it makes sense. But again, now it's like like someone posted that meme recently, BLM. It shows them burning stuff, and it goes, "What level of privilege do you have to have to destroy things and be called peaceful?" It's like if you were truly under attack, they would have released the dogs, fire hoses, live rounds, whatever on you, and you'd be either dead or in jail. If they're if the media is covering for you, making excuses, saying how oh, we should be on your side, how is that oppression? I don't really follow. But it's like it's like they're still adhering to his logic, even though the situation itself has changed since then. Uh. Yeah. And this part of what you have to think of with some of these things, with the, with the level of tolerance, as we mentioned, this was supposed to be an industrialized society. And then you look at certain ideologies and certain ways of doing things that come from places that are not necessarily quite that way, especially when you have the sort of immigration you have in the United States of America. You look at someone like uh, Congress, uh, Congressperson Ilhan Omar mm -hmm. from Minnesota. She was a recent immigrant from Somalia. The method in which she came to the United States of America is a bit different from the generalized way in the United States of America, unless you're like talking some Alabama or Appalachian type of people when it comes to marital relationships between <laughs> close relatives and things like that. 
then um, after that, you've had a situation where with the politics, some of the things she's done, like with the Project Veritas going on and seeing like, yeah, these are just people of recent Somali descent who are out in the community taking in uh, votes and going to places and talking to people and saying you should vote this way and just openly saying this. Because in Somalia, this is a regular thing. I'm recording this from Nairobi, Kenya, which is bordering of Somalia. And even here, we have just open levels of just absurdities that are not really accepted where you need some more need some more um, levels of sophistication, of, of, of obfuscation in the United States of America to do those kind of political practices, yet here it's just in the open. So that's yeah. something that was being done. It's thickened thick and through with people that she knows, her community. She she now moved on to marry a, a, and a someone who's uh, been, I think, multi-generation American, but his company was also being getting money from for from her campaign to campaign, so that's keeping it within the clan, keeping it within the family. These things are, are a lot stronger in that kind of sense. So you're talking yeah. about the interests, the connections. Who is in power? Who is in the connections? Yeah. And I think one thing that is different, and what I'm take, what I'm talking to about regular people on the left, just you, the average person who's an average Democrat who's not that politically involved, doesn't understand how how willing some people are going to be to do certain things that you may not agree with in the yeah. name, in your name. Yeah. Like Ilhan Omar recently came out and she's saying, oh, this is ridiculous. Like we have what's what's the pro, what's if we have a majority, if we have a majority, if we have control, if we can't get our, our, our ideas through, it's just paraphrasing, then what's the point of this? And this is just a very slim majority. It's like yeah. Kamala Harris is the tiebreaker. You can't just keep tiebreaking every single thing. You still have to have some kind of even yeah. this uniparty kind of state of the United States of America. You still have to have some kind of back and forth. Even within the Democrats, there's people who vote against. Even within the Republicans, there's people who come across. Then when you go to the House of Representatives, that's, again, a different kind of situation. Even when it comes to Joe Biden, Joe Biden is a classic politics-as-usual guy. He's going to understand the jockeying and things like this. And he's also thinking, all these other politicians are also thinking, this is long-term. I want to have this job for next year, so I can't just burn all these bridges. Yeah. But she's just coming out and saying, no, no, we have the power now. Even if it's just 50, 50 plus 1 percent, we have the power. We should just ram our things through. He is, they are becoming the sort of person that Marcuse was talking about here. That's the thing I was wondering, like, if he actually lived now, who would he say was actually in the power? Like you yeah. mentioned, back then in 65, yes, the structures might have been conservative. They might have been on the right. But yeah. right now, to anyone with any average sense cannot look at the structure of the United States of America and claim that is something that is more on the political right. Yeah, and I, and I always point that out. I'm like, that's just not my opinion. They've studied that. I mean, Pew Research said, what, 92, 93 percent of journalists identify on the left, 76 percent are registered Democrats, academics. I know they say, you know, some of these universities, it's 90 percent are on the left. I know sociology departments, it's like 20 to 1, 50 to 1 ratio, whatever. So it's like, again, if there's all of all these conservatives have power, like aside from talk radio, some of the Internet, Fox somewhat, you know, I don't even consider Fox that conservative. It's like where what power do they have where is this coming from you give me the evidence for that and i have yet to see any yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know going back to what was actually read here i pretty much agree with all of it like i mean it, it starts getting eerier towards the end because like i wrote in here in general i'm for discrimination like i discriminate against food that's unhealthy sometimes i don't do too well i was a lot worse about that in my past right now i'm going through another cycle to get a bit lower but i discriminate against food that's unhealthy I, I think it's good to discriminate against people who are unwise because they might put people that that you know, like if you're in a in a group, you're protesting and you see some people who seem to be getting kind of violent, picking up bricks, discriminate against those people. Say, no, you need to stop doing that. You need to leave. We are here doing something peaceful. We need to make sure you go out, secure, move you around, away from the people because that person is going to lead to damaging your cause. That person might do something that ends up getting the cops to come and shoot rubber bullets and hit someone who's with you and things like that. So you need to discriminate to get that person away. Like you should also be able to discriminate against the people that you're with. Somebody shouldn't be forced in an arranged marriage or forced to date somebody or forced to have yeah. intercourse or have any relations with somebody. No, you should have choice in who you can actually open, yeah. start partner with and start a family with. But when you start talking, when you start taking that from the individual level, and you start mentioning the societal level that gets into further in this repressive tolerancing. It's like, who is deciding this when you're on that societal yeah. level? If, now, if you're saying that we're also living in a society that isn't fit for liberty, then what limits exist on the social scale? Are there literally no limits right now? That's yeah. why I was just wondering, even at this point, I was like, is he actually going to define when the goal of a society where liberty can exist to the point where you can have that pure tolerance type of state 
I, and I, I didn't see that in the actual document. Maybe maybe somebody else has seen it somehow actually written out, but f from my recent reading of it, I did not see a part where you did that. Well, and that's what's scary. I mean, it's supposed to be creating the ideal democracy, but ultimately this is, I would argue, a very totalitarian document. And like all totalitarians, what's sort of scary with this is how far are they willing to go to achieve their ideal? It's not, okay, we pass a few laws and okay, we've won, move on, do other things. It's no, no, we have to stamp out every last little vestige of intolerance, but that goalpost keeps shifting. Or as you like to analogize, sometimes there are no goalposts even. It just becomes, you, you know, I mean, this whole thing with cancel culture, I mean, recently, Mr. Potato Head, now my friend sent me something, people are complaining about the Volvo logo. It's it's like, where, where, where does this end? It's like, it just, it's this, it's a sliding bar that never stops sliding. It's like, it's like, I mean, should we just paint everything one color or like, what, like how, you know, what, where do we go from here? <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's an odd situation. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So talking about painting, I think that's, that's good to come up in this next section. Okay. Yeah. This is the excerpt I took from page three. Such indiscriminate tolerance is justified in harmless, um, in harmless debates, in conversation, in academic discussion. It is indispensable in the scientific enterprise, in private religion. But society cannot be indiscriminate where the pacification of existence, where freedom and happiness themselves are at stake. Here, certain things cannot be said. Certain ideas cannot be expressed. Certain policies cannot be proposed. Certain behavior cannot be permitted without making tolerance an instrument for the continuation of servitude. The danger of destructive tolerance, which is by Baudelaire, or of benevolent neutrality toward art has, has, been recognized, has been recognized. The market, which absorbs equally well, although with often, quits, often quite sudden fluctuations, art, anti-art, and non-art, are, are possible conflicting styles, schools, forms, uh, provides sorry, provides a complacent receptacle, a friendly abyss, in uh, which the radical impact of art, the protest of art against the established reality, is swallowed up. However, censorship of art and literature is regressive under all circumstances. The authentic oeuvre is not and cannot be a prop of oppression, and pseudo-art, which can be such a prop, is not art. Art stands against history, withstands history, which has been the history of oppression, for all subjects rea reality to laws other than the established ones, to the laws of the form which create a different reality, which creates a different reality, negation of the established one, even where art depicts the established reality. But in its struggle with history, art itself, uh, sorry, art subjects itself to history. History enters the definition of art and enters into the distinction between art and pseudo-art. Thus, it happens that what was once art becomes pseudo-art. Previous forms, styles, and qualities, previous modes of protest and refusal cannot be recaptured in or against a different society. Hmm. Okay, that was a bit, a bit lengthy, but, but yeah, it's... It, well, it's, it's kind of interesting because for those who don't know, his colleague Theodore Adorno, he actually... A major point of his focus was actually criticizing bourgeois culture. So he criticized music, movies, things like that. How how do the how does the ruling class create things that reinforce their status and sort of crowds out lower crowds out the proletariat, as it were? And it was funny because one of my friends listened to some of his. Uh, I guess he had some piano songs or something. I was like, what does it sound like? He's just like slam a piano a few times. It's basically what it sounds like. And <laughs> I, I, I guess, but I guess, you know, he saw it as the, you know, the ruling class perpetuates their music and their art because it upholds their status. So we need to give voice to the lower class people. But I find that kind of absurd because it's like, if you listen to rap, I mean, a lot of those guys came from poverty and they're talking about like, like Biggie Smalls talked about like, how his neighbor was a drug dealer and like took care of him and things like that. And these guys ended up millionaires by the end of their lives. So you could argue, yeah, he ultimately rose in that position, but he started with nothing. And it's, it's a similar thing with, you know, you hear those actors, similar things. Like there are actors who just get noticed by the right people and go on to super fame versus people who come from money, get master's degrees. You never hear about them again. So it, it, it's. I think it's sort of a misframing of the argument, the idea of, oh, the, this is rich art, this is rich culture, these are poor people, this is poor culture, because it's like people, it's transitory. People can go from one to the other. People can lose it all. You know, it's not set in stone either way. Yeah. yeah. 
and it, it, it is it is something where it's rather subjective and that's that's yeah. the thing that i think was was kind of it started getting kind of eerie here and i'm like hmm, wait i work what you say here so like the first part where you say okay society can be discriminated i understand that and you see he puts out the thing he's saying there's an importance in science there's an importance in math and like a private religion having certain things having certain kind of conversations like those are things that he's actually mentioning there but then it starts getting into the whole arts part here and I have a background in art, and I still do a lot of art in my, in my regular daily life. Still earn some money doing it. So I consider myself somewhat of an artist. But when it comes to like the liberal arts, which a lot of this the thoughts and things are coming from, then they talk about how with the liberal arts, you can't apply that sort of rationale to it. It's something that is more nebulous in them. Like that's that's how you see them. They, they never you can never really stick them down. So it's just art. It's just something speaking against power. It's it's just look, the arts the, the artists are, are on our side. Mm-hmm. So there is something where I think you see that coming from there. Mm-hmm. And then there's an, another part here I just realized why do they keep very often you hear people saying, why do some of these people seem to be complaining about things like we're still living in the 60s? Yeah. And part of that is because you, even here he says you can't use those same kind of protests, those same kind of forms or protests that were back in the artistic kind of ways to a different society. So it's like if the society has changed from what it was in the 60s, then taking the ideas like repressive tolerance and getting the same kind of behavior that was going on, the same kind of walk marches and things like that, fighting against the system in those same ways cannot be done if that system actually has changed. And it did change because of the fights in the 60s, because of stuff that probably... Makuza helped with during that time, in that contemporary time, helped actually change that culture to the preferable culture that it is today. But yeah. some of these people, in order to continue this fight, they have to adopt that and push that mentality onto the rest of society and say, no, we want to be like the Black Panthers of old. So you have to be like the structure. Mm-hmm. You have to be like the power structure of old, too, because otherwise we'll, we won't have an enemy to fight. So they yeah. kind of set that up and, and bring this... Um, Potemkin enemy up. <laughs> they, they kind of have to fight against. Well, I don't well, know. Th- think of what I brought up in the previous series about, uh, or one of the previous series, I should say, about St. George and retirement syndrome. Okay, we've killed the dragon. We ended segregation, but that's not enough. We got to find something else to destroy. Okay, BLM is rioting and not facing consequences. It's not enough. The system's still oppressive. Oprah's a billionaire. Well, it's not enough. The system's still oppressive. Like, it just, it, they, they keep coming up with monsters to slay. And after a while, it's like, are these monsters or are you just murdering your neighbor's dogs? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like you see, that's yeah. the thing. They they plugged in that that mm. postmodernism thing, where the the basic part of postmodernism is always has oppression. And I think he even says that somewhere in here, where he says like you think with the arts is something about oppression that's that's a constant thing. Like society constantly has that aspect in it, and that's. I I don't think that's society. I think that's, and I don't I don't, I don't want to say it's a natural state of things, but it's it's something that. It's it, part of the reason my channel is dying alive. It's because like once you're born, you're in a constant state of dying. You're constantly fighting off dying. Once you're alive, you're constantly fighting off the condition of being dead. So the yeah. thing you actually are more actively doing, if you don't do anything, you are dying. Yeah. <laughs> like your actions are the things that that let you to continue to be alive. That's that's your your default state is dying. So, so that's the kind of thing we look at nature and the default state of nature is a lack of care. It's not oppressive. It just doesn't give a damn. But yeah. we consider that to be oppressive to now to get into the point where if I'm just like, OK, you just go do whatever you want to do. We're going to be over here. Just leave us alone. People now consider that oppressive. And yeah. I think that's how nature is. So it's gotten to the point where people imagine the general state of nature to be oppressive and they don't realize that all the concepts we have in society, all these other things are the things that actually make reduce the actual oppressive nature if you want to define that as oppression of what nature is, what life actually is, existing is. Yeah, it's like the people who go on and on about the environment and climate change and all this, but they live in big cities, they're happy to take jets, all this. I mean, take all those things away. Would those people be happy? No, they'd be complaining. Oh, I don't have my Wi-Fi. I don't have my phone. I, it takes forever to travel. It's like, I mean, you can't have it both ways here. It's, it's you know, we're, we're, we're not going to go back to Rousseau's, you know, state of nature and all that but have have all the modern luxuries at the same time it's like you have to accept that there are trade-offs here as thomas soul always yeah. has taught us uh. and i think one of the things i, I just listened to a recent recent uh um recording of recent podcast of alex epstein in the um, power hour and he was talking about one of the things when he talks to people when he engages people uh in getting into energy issues and things like that or climate issues one of the things he doesn't do is engage people who don't at least rec- acknowledge the present 
like, yes, you can say, okay, the climate issues are things that we need to do, but we still do live in the best time of history that we understand. We have the most control over it. We reduce the numbers of people dying through climate, but we can still improve. But the yeah. people who come out and say, okay, right now is the worst time ever, and we, we need to do better, those are the people he's like, okay, I'm not going to deal with. And that's yeah. the same kind of situation here. I'm okay with talking about racial issues, but at least admit that we've actually improved a lot from yeah. what, what it has been, what it is in other places in the world. And then we can work from that point where, okay, at least we can agree on where we are and then let's talk about how we can get to places. But if you think where we are is already garbage, then that's already throwing away all the ways that we got to where we are from where we've been. So that's the kind of things that are that are going to reduce the amount of actual conversation and understanding that I can have with somebody from who doesn't recognize the present. Sure. Right. Okay. So the next part, let me hopefully do a better job at reading this time. Okay. I shall discuss this question only with reference to political movements, attitudes, schools of thoughts, philosophies, which are political in the, in the widest sense. Affecting the society at whole, as a whole, demonstrably as transcending the sphere of privacy. Moreover, I propose a shift in the focus of discussion. It will be concerned not only and not primarily with tolerance towards radical extremes, minorities, subversives, etc. But rather, with tolerance towards majorities, toward official and public opinion, towards the established protectors of freedom. In this case, the discussion can have as a frame of reference only a democratic society, in which people as individuals and as members of political and other organizations participate in the making, sustaining, and changing policies. In an authoritarian system, the people do not tolerate, they suffer established policies. Under a system of constitutionally guaranteed and generally, um, and without too many and too glaring exceptions, practice civil rights and liberties, opposition and dissent are tolerated unless they issue in violence and or in exhortation to an organization of violent sub subversion. The underlying assumption is that the established society is free and that any improvement, even a change in the social structure and social values, would come about in a normal course of events, prepared, defined, and tested in free and equal discussion, and on the open marketplace of ideas and goods. Hmm. All right. Um, not a lot to say there. I mean, I think it's the usual. It talks about, you know, majority and all, but then, again, that raises the question of who's the majority and who has the power, Again, same thing in his time during his time, it makes sense. Now it's if you if you think that it's kind of skewed, uh, we we could maybe provide a link to James Lindsay's videos on this as well. And he even talks about this, how the woke the woke actually fit a lot of the stuff they're criticizing. Like they talk about, you know, oh, the power of people using power and influence to you clamp down on people who disagree with them. It's like, well, what are they doing? It's like, you know, they're they're like the Klan does not hold institutional power and is secretly running police departments, all this. The woke SJWs do have a lot of institutional power. If you think otherwise, you're either lying to yourself or you're totally oblivious. <laughs> yeah, and with this, it's, it seems generally agreeable. You see, what he's saying is like, okay, if you're in this kind of situation, when in something where it's kind of democratic, with this kind of freedoms, mm -hmm. people interact with each other, open a marketplace of ideas and goods, you exchange those, and then people kind of figure out ways to actually deal with it. These are kind of libertarian type of ideas, they're kind of freedom type of ideas that the anarchist type of ideas that, that could exist without the state. But here, he says, now, when you live in this situation, you can't do this. Now you have to be in violent suppression. You see, yeah. think about the way in current society is framed by different groups. Think about the Antifa type on one side, or the Black Lives Matter, some of these activist people, or some of the rad femmes, they think that society is inherently vile. Yeah. So they're in this situation where they're like, they put themselves by Marcuse's thoughts, have been in that situation where it's like now, they're the ones who have to be, who are justfully, in, in, they're using violent forms of subversion. That's, that's, that's okay to them because they, they feel they're in a certain, in a constant case of just being yeah. subjected to this oppressive force. Then you have other people on the side who are more status and people on the political right and things like that who might think, oh, it's a divinely, it's a divinely fine kind of society. It's been selected by God. Like God made it special. Like he came down in, in the Middle East and he started, his son came down at that point. Then the, the word was spread around the world and things like that. And eventually they came to the founding fathers and then now he decided let's move to the United States of America. And then that will be the new place that will spread this divine um, plan that God has had. So 
how dare you try to tear down this divinely planned and document of the Constitution and all these things, because these, these are things that are just inherently good. This, this, you can't say there's anything bad about this. So for those people, they think in this kind of sense, where they're like, just let things be and things will improve by themselves. And I disagree with both of the people. It's, it's a human situation. It's not inherently evil. It's not divinely selected. There are issues to deal with, but are we in the position where it's like, okay, it's completely oppression, so we have to have the situation where we are getting to these points of violence. And then in the specific, when he talks about who are the groups here, he says that now this is not tolerance about the minority, this is tolerance about, should we tolerate the majorities? So I asked some of the people who look at the, like, says, like just look at feminists in general. Feminists, females are 52% or 51% of the population in the world. So technically you are a majority. So most, I think you look at people who vote, I think most of the people who vote are women. <laughs> like, so it's kind of a situation where it's like, okay, so who is the majority? Now you have the Democrats. You kind of control the places. So who is the majority anymore? You look at the places we're talking, the schools, the, the institutions. It's mostly people who identify as Democrats. So who is the majority that we should not tolerate because they have control over the official public opinion, established protectors of freedoms? Like, who, who are those people? Is it really the political right, the, the conservatives? Is it really them? I don't know. Again, show me the evidence if that's true. the the point I the point I was going to add to that too was um, uh, where I, where I sort of get torn on this is I don't know whether the people who push that narrative that you and I keep talking about I don't know if they actually sincerely believe that they're under attack or like if they're just so indoctrinated they can't see beyond the ideology or if they know the truth and they're just using it to gain power i think it's a mix of both i think there are people who are just ideologically possessed who just buy into this stuff and just push it because they think they're doing the right thing and i think there are other people like ibram x kenny who just take advantage of the situation it's oh everyone's concerned about racism okay i'm gonna write a book and do lots of work on this oh you know jack dorsey okay here's 10 million dollars to do it okay thanks you know there are i think it's a bit of both i think there are people who are ideologically possessed and just wrapped up in the ideology so much they can't see clearly and i do think there are other people who know what's going on but they're just taking advantage of the situation yeah I think it's, it's, it's kind of the bell curve situation where yeah. there's going to be a spread of things. And you look at this in the same way, like in a fandom, how many people are truly Steelers fans that they can tell you about the different quarterbacks, the plays yeah. they run, how many people on the team? Most people just go to the game because they just go to the game. How many people really believe in Jesus Christ because they've read the entire Bible and can quote you things? And like my grandmother could, but most Christians I've met can't. Like, no. they just don't care. Not every not every Catholic is going to be the Pope. So who no. are the Popes and who are the priests and who is the Vatican of these kind of ideologies. And I think that's something we discussed previously where as we were pre prepping for this, yeah. getting this set up, I was like, great. to me, one thing I'd like to do from this now that I understand or getting to understand and absorb this material is find a more effective way to identify who are the people that know and still act that way. Who are the people who are just following it? You know, yeah. who are the people who are just Sunday Christians and who are the people who are like the Pope who's like got access to the catacomb and is like out there plotting and planning things. Like those are the people that I want to be aware of and find a way to engage those people. And, the rest of the people are just kind of just people. Well, I, I made the comment recently, too. I think you might have seen one of my posts where I talked about how I, for a while I generalized with leftists, but I think that's unfair. And I'm lately I'm distinguishing more between Democrat partisans versus principled progressives because there are certain people who, you know, they're the types who will rail against money in politics when it's a Republican and a Democrat does. They look the other way. You know, a Republican gets confused accused of sexual harassment it's believe all women democrat they look the other way they complain about war during the bush years during obama it was okay during trump the peace deals were somehow a bad thing now biden's attacking syria somehow that's okay so i'm trying to differentiate between the people who actually like there are principled progressives like tim pool cites a few of them like jimmy Dore, kyle kalinsky all that like i have my disagreements but they generally stick to their principles they criticize surveillance war corruption all that so you know as much as i disagree i have a certain level of respect for them for consistency and then there's other people who just support the democrats no matter what and you know the de it's that whole thing of oh i could shoot a baby on tv would they do anything no they would give you some bs justification as to why it's okay and then that gets into uh, as I mentioned, I think in a previous video, it's like, well, why do you even support them in the first place? Do you care about these things? Or is there some underlying tribal reason that you have and you're just you're willing to tolerate all sorts of absurdity? Yeah, yeah I, 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 too, will just second that, that I am a fan yeah. of consistency and uh, people who are consistent yeah. and self-aware. I, I prefer those. I'd rather you be consistent yeah. and self-aware about things that you're wrong about yeah. than be wrong and just pretend that that yeah. you're right or, or try to pretend like I'm not seeing what, what I'm actually seeing. Those are the people that really arc me. Yeah. All right. Okay, so now page five, the section. 
With affluent democracy, the affluent discussion prevails, and within the established framework, it is tolerant to a large extent. All points of view can be heard, the communist and the fascist, the left and the right, the white and the Negro, the crusader for armament and for disarmament. Moreover, in endlessly dragging debates over the media, the stupid opinion is treated with the same respect as the intelligent one. The misinformed may talk as long as the informed, and propaganda rides along with education, truth with falsehood. This pure toleration of sense and nonsense is justified by the democratic argument that nobody, neither group nor individual, is in possession of the truth and capable of defining what is right and wrong, good and bad. Therefore, all contesting opinions must be submitted to the people for its deliberation and choice. But I have already suggested that the democratic argument implies a necessary condition, namely, that the people must be capable of deliberating and choosing or on the basis of knowledge, that they must have access to authentic information, and that, on this basis, their evaluation must be the result of autonomous thought. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's interesting because initially what he's describing, I mean, that's what democracy is. Like stupid and smart people have the same opinions. Like I'm learning that, you know, lately I've been talking about investing in the whole Wall Street bets thing. And they taught and like these two guys I was listening to, they were talking about, oh, there's misinformation, bulls and bears both spreading misinformation. It's like, but that's part of democracy. You know, if every if everyone can buy stocks. There are people who are who want the stock to go up in price, so they're going to hype it up, even lie about it. There's people who want the stock to go down; they're either going to short sell it or buy more, so they're going to spread misinformation that way. That's part of the game. That's that's just so you, you it falls on you to do the due diligence to cut through all the noise, do your own research, and realize, okay, how much of this is real versus how much of it is fake. Like I read the comments in the Weeble, that's a stock trading app. I read the comments in the sec in the um, different stock. Uh, sections and like i find them kind of funny but i wouldn't base my advice off those because some of it some of it's valid stuff some of it is trolls some of it's bots who are spreading misinformation it's all sorts of stuff but again that just illustrates that's what democracy is everyone's going to say something everyone has a voice some of it the information's good some of it's bad you but it falls on you to decide what's good and what's bad oh. and see that's one thing that i think i'm realizing or yeah. there's, there's a lot of things that I, i'm a child on that i i will not decide to to participate in but there's certain things where, like, my knowledge is is childlike to certain things, right? Just not aware of these things. If someone asks me, uh, like my friend, I'm not I'm not I'm not that familiar with cars. I, I've traveled around the world. I've lived in places in cities that that have vehicles. So I've owned like one car. I didn't really get into too much. I really like watching like the racing things and things like that. Like, but in general, if someone's like, okay, I'm going to buy a car, can you give me your opinion on what kind of I should be looking for? I'm like, no, you should probably ask somebody else. But there's people who would feel. Just because they're around cars, they would feel they their opinion should be something that's that's understood on it. Whereas if I was just reading a site, maybe I'd, I'd have the ability to go on and say, okay, these are my needs. I can weigh things. But maybe there are people who just – it seems like people do fall for some of the fakest sort of news. Like yeah. where somebody just some, something that seems clearly false to me, someone is following that. Like mm. – I'm not even going to apologize for like the Bible. I read the Bible. And just, it seems clearly false to me, but then millions of people are following it. So I'm like, yeah. when when they make these things, am I overestimating how clear falsehoods are for people? Like, <laughs> they just do this with these things. Like, how can you believe that? It's, what's going on? Well, there's also wishful thinking because I see this with the stock trading too. Like, you know, the AMC stock, which I'm currently invested in, it's about, it's just under nine bucks, but there are people who will be like, oh, it's going to be 200 in the next few days. It's like, no <laughs> stock rises that quickly. Or they're like, there's other people who's like, oh, it's going to be a dollar by the end of the day. Oh yeah, it's going to drop that much too. It's like, but then again, there's also wishful thinking. There are people who are hoping it'll be that high because then, wow, I'm going to cash out and be rich. But of course you have to think, well, realistically, is this going to happen? Let me think of a longer term plan here. And it, with a similar thing here, too, I think it may be a similar thing as well. It's wishful thinking. Like, people have become invested in certain belief systems. They believed them for so many years. They didn't ask questions. And it's one of those things that, like, the more time passes, the more and more invested you are. And then it's harder to get away from it because all your friendships, relationships, everything have been built up around this. And just to completely turn on all of that overnight, I mean, I don't think almost anyone can do that. Uh, uh. Mm. I think interesting here was he said when he write white Negro, he capitalized Negro. So that's kind of like how the black has been changed. So I think like that's what I was saying. Like black is a different tribe. It's a specific tribe in the United States of America. And if you want to treat it that way, then I understand the capitalization of it because it's like it's like Oriental. It's it's a different kind of category of like if you say the Luya tribe here in Kenya, 
that's a specific tribe and that would be capitalized because you're talking about the specific groups of people, kind of like Negro is a specific thing where I think Caucasian, if he had written that instead of white, maybe he would have capitalized that. But um, here it's good how he's talking about people talking on both sides. Now, if they're talking about the freedom of thought, who is controlling information now? Is yeah. it people on the political left or political right? Who is the one standing in the way of it? But at the same point, you've heard that movement where people are saying, oh, we need to get, we need to depart from these people. We need these people off. And that's part of that here where they're saying, oh, the only way you can get to this kind of level where people can make these decisions of themselves is if they're, first of all, smart enough. And this is a key thing, the educator. Are they the educated? Who's the most, who gets the most educated vote? Who has the most degrees? There's, there's stuff that you see there in the political left. They want to seem like we are the educated. We are the ones who can understand these things. You little peasants can't understand this. Yeah. So we have to protect you from all the mean Fox News people, from all the mean Q. Like, I went to the Q Reddit, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I don't believe these things. But apparently, millions of people did. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, right now we record this on Mar March 3rd. There's still people who think that Donald Trump is the president, is a shadow president of the United States of America, and there's going to be some kind of thing where they're going to go in and arrest all the people on March 4th. There's people, at least there was rumblings of that. Now, I don't think any actual activity will go around it, but no. on the inverse side, there's actually a, people on in, in government have said, they, okay, we need to get the troops ready. We need to get some kind of security force ready yeah. because there's a threat of that. And that kind of goes back to the whole, uh, the whole, the whole Wall Street, no, 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 Wall Street, the raid on Area 51 thing. Remember that? Like yeah. end of yeah, 2019? Yeah. yeah. There was like military people were talking about it because we, you don't know. You, you put it out there. Most of the people are, this is a troll. But for some people, how many people does it take for them to be like, oh, let's actually do it? So, so there's these kind of things where, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I understand. I understand. But then at the same point, like I mentioned, if you're so much against fake news, if you're so much against certain information that inspires people to do things that is, has little to no evidence, if news stations were really about that, they would stop preaching, they would stop anyone talking about religion because those religions are based on less information and evidence than any of the stuff you find on Q. Yeah. Than any yeah. of the stuff you find about transgenders being being met. Like that stuff yeah. doesn't that stuff is illogical, this contemporary stuff, but it doesn't require magic. No. The the stuff in religions requires magic, and we know there's a longer history of people doing rather evil things based on those magical type of thoughts. So if they were truly about factual reality, rational things, that would be banned too. But you can see it's not that. It's about selective things, selective truths and selective evidence. More Russia is okay, yeah. but fortification of the election is not okay to talk about. <laughs> so that's well, the kind it, of situation. It's also like, you know, they say, you know, I know some family members who bought into this, too, that white supremacy is the biggest threat in America. And I'm like, again, what is your evidence for that? I keep saying over and over, the Klan is a dying organization. At its peak, it had like three million members. Today, it's like low thousands. Um, you know, Stormfront, what is that? Have a few hundred people. It's like you're picking these fringe examples and holding them up like somehow these are embraced by the mainstream when, you know, most rank and file conservatives reject them completely. Yeah, OK, they're trolls or ridiculous people on the Internet, but majority accepting this no i mean give me the evidence for that and then the, again that goes to what i said a few minutes ago where i'm torn i don't know do they actually believe that or they just live in that bubble or is it they're trying to stir this up either for ratings for money or there's some other agenda because the facts don't bear it out yeah yeah all right now next section and yeah. just to the people listening part of the reason i'm reading these in long form is some of the things i might be little parts at the end that i wanted to focus on and i suggest again you listen to the whole thing but I want to put in, if you listen to this, at least enough context. So if someone comes just to listen to the analysis, they can see I'm not taking this necessarily so much out of context by putting things that are also before and around it. Like if there was something important, I took pretty much the entire paragraph or the entire half paragraph and the half one next to it to put it in some kind of context within the document. Okay. Within the affluent democracy, the affluent discussion prevails. And within the established framework, it is tolerant to a large extent. All points of view can be heard. The communists no, and the fascists, uh, did I say this already? Oh, wait. Yeah, I yeah, think sorry, that's the that, part that, you just read. part yeah. of uh, part there. Okay, so what, what are the part that I'm adding? Uh, sorry, I, I took this in a way that, let me try and see if there was a part here where it comes in, autonomous thought, tabula rasa. Now, where is, hmm, sorry, um, getting all thrown off here. So autonomous thought, authentic evaluation. Trying to find where I added in here because there's a part in here where he says something. Okay, no, right here, right here. Let's start here. Okay. 
So therefore, all contesting opinions must be submitted to the people for the deliberation of choice. But I have already suggested that the democratic argument implies a necessary condition, namely that the people must be capable to do uh, with truth. And if truth is more than a matter of logic and science, then this kind of objectivity is false, and this kind of truth uh, tolerance inhuman. And if it is necessary to break the established universe of meaning and practice enclosed in this universe in order to enable man to find out what is true and false, this deceptive impartiality would have to be abandoned. The people exposed to this impartiality are no tabula rasa. They are indoctrinated by the conditions under which they live and think and which they do not transcend. To enable them to become autonomous, to find themselves what is uh, to find by themselves what is true and false for men uh, in the existing society, they would have to be freed from the prevailing indoctrination, which is no longer recognized as indoctrination. So that's the part I wanted to add there because he says something that if truth is more than logic and science, and I don't know if he's saying that is what it is, or you're saying like if that's the proposal, but then the end part here where he's saying these kind of people that are in that sense where if truth is more than a matter of logic and science. They're in a place where they're indoctrinated, and you have to break them out of the indoctrination, which is no longer considered as indoctrination. And this is something that I saw like with the Christian right. Part of the reason people in the Christian right really fight so much about what's going on by the cathedral, t taking care of the kids, controlling the kids from K through 12 and then through university, is because they understand the effect. There's no Christian children. There's no Muslim children. There's no Democrat children. There's no Republican children. There's children of Christians, there's children of, of Muslims, there's children of Democrats, there's children of Republicans. People understand the ability to actually program your child into a certain belief system. Yeah. So the Christians understand because they, they were taught as kids and they were indoctrinated in the system. They don't think it's indoctrination when they do it to their kids. The leftists, the progressives, they understand because they were indoctrinated. I, for them, I think I don't think they necessarily understand as much. I think to them, no, they don't even no. consider it indoctrination, but they were indoctrinated as kids, and then they grow up, and they indoctrinate the kids again, and then you tell them it's indoctrination. No, it's not a religion. No, we're not indoctrinating the kids. You are indoctrinating the children. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's what you do. Well, well, again, it goes to what you said about consistency and self-awareness. These people generally are not self-aware. They, they don't see the parallels between their belief systems and religion. They don't see the dogma that can't be questioned. Uh, I say social justice is a cult. They think I'm being hyperbolic. I'm like, well, let's see, dogma that can't be questioned, pressure to disassociate from people who don't follow it, um, you know, the usual thing of we in the cult know how things really are. Everyone else is either insane or brainwashed or stupid or indoctrinated, whatever. It's like they don't have the self-awareness to see all those parallels. Again, it doesn't mean that I don't have my biases, prejudices, inconsistencies, blind spots. You know, my thought process isn't perfect either, but I am capable of stepping back and saying, okay, why do I believe this and all that? And are there inconsistencies? Are there errors? And you and several of my other friends, you guys are not afraid to be honest and tell me what I'm wrong, which I appreciate because that's how I learn things. Whereas with these people, it's, it's, if you go, the second you go into the realm of do not question any of this, I mean, you're basically, it's basically a religion, whether secular or otherwise, you're not going to convince me otherwise. <laughs> Yeah. You look at who are the people who are saying, oh, it's yeah. it's about being moral. It's about it's yeah. about being moral rather than being rationally correct, like yeah. rather than being factually correct. Like it, logic and things like that are things of white people. We need to put that in the past. Yeah. Like, oh, we need black black ways of knowing. We need we need to get the white sciences yeah. out of here. You, math is racist now. Like this is absurdities. Who are the people talking about these things? And you're trying to tell me those people aren't indoctrinated? Like, come on. These people, well, those are the people who think truth is not a matter of logic and science. Truth is a matter of logic yeah. and science. Well, and to, to sort of add on, add on to that, I remember I posted something about transgender stuff, and this uh, woman I used to work with wrote something about there's other things besides your biased logic or something like that. And I'm like, what does that what, mean? Like, what, what does that mean? Logic, as I've said before, using Ayn Rand's definition, it's the art of non-contradictory identification. Like, you wouldn't say the mathematical equations that go into these computers are biased. Biased towards what? They're they they're built a certain way to achieve a certain end result. Biased towards achieving the end result maybe but it's like how how is logic biased you know you wouldn't say again i used the analogy before the mathematical equations that are used to build bridges which keep them up you wouldn't say those are biased those should be the way they are if they're not the bridge collapses people die it's like i, I don't know what you're getting at with logic is biased it's yeah. it's usually code for i don't like the end result so i'm trying to find a way to rationalize it away and i would sort of add on to what marcuse is saying being that he's a marxist well if you know uh Mar Marx himself didn't come up with it. We'll talk about it in the human action section, but the idea of polylogism, the idea that different groups think differently and that logic isn't universal. It's just a matter of 
status. It, it was called standpoint epistemology as well. And you see that, like you said, black ways of knowing, female ways of knowing, all that. And I feel like that's kind of what he's slipping in here, the idea that, well, the way things have been run is seen through the lens of white males and that we need another way of knowing to achieve the end result. But of course, this you have to throw out science, you have to throw out reason, you have to throw out all the positive things that I'm sure he and others have taken for granted in favor of chaos, essentially. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think I, one thing you can do, you, you can, people definitely can apply logic in a biased way. But once yeah. you apply it, it's either logic or not. You can yeah. say, I'll be logical about this, about my yeah. workplace, and about, let's say you're an engineer, I'll be logical about that. But when I come home, I'm not going to be logical about the relations I have with my wife and the kids because I'll, I'll be abusive to the wife and hit her and hit the kids. Because in that sense, I'm not applying logic to our relationship saying, oh, if I was at work and I saw some, the, 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 um, our manager hitting us, that would not actually accomplish any actual results that the person wants. But that's logical there. But then when I come home, I'm going to turn off my logic and not apply it to say like, oh, if I want things actually done better at home, the, the way to do this is not hitting my wife or my kids. Like th that's that's a situation where you can say, okay, that person is not consistently logical, but it's not the hitting of the kids and the wife is not biased logic. It's no. just not using logic. It's having yeah. a bias to use logic at work and not use it at home. I think that's yeah. that's at most that I can get after the, what that person said. <laughs> well, 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 like like I I have a relative. Well, I, I probably have a few now, but like who are bad with time management and. We were wondering because this relative, like when it came to like work and other things, like that person was always on time and everything. But when it came to personal stuff, they never were. So I wonder if it's a similar dynamic where it's like they sort of shut that off. They like they like they're kind of carefree with time management because they see it as well. It's my time. I'll do what I feel like. But then with something like work, they realize like, OK, my job's on the line. I better do everything on time. So they're very focused. And then outside, it's like whatever. I don't care. So it could be a similar kind of dynamic. Yeah. 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 And but and and that's what I'm saying to people. People have to realize these things are connected. Yeah. Yes, we are individuals, but you can't have a collective without individuals. So yeah. you have to understand. You have to apply this. And the things we have to lose are are innumerable. Like we we're living in an exceptionally amazing time to be alive. Like b because life is so good, it also means we've never had a time in life where we've had so much to lose. Where we yeah. can lose more than we can still lose more than the levels of comforts and advancement that humanity has had in majority of humanity since I think until the 1900s, even a little later than that, even like 1950s, 1960s, we could lose like 60%, even, yeah, let's say 50% of human advancement, we could lose it and still be better off than we were in the 50s. <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. how amazing time is today. So so think about, we have, we have so much to lose. So yes, we can take steps back, but we have so much more to gain. Like, People, there's, 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 there's spaceships on Mars. Come on, people. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we can become solarians. We need to actually start embracing this logic and science in all aspects of yeah. our life and, and seeing the human flourishing that can come from that. Just please, people. Yeah. Oh, did you see where they're talking about a hotel in space now in the next uh, dec within the next decade or so? Oh, yeah. I saw that. The, the private people yeah. who are doing that, they yeah. kind of like, I uh, think it's own gravity and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Are they aiming for the like La, La, sorry the Lagrange points? Like I heard some things where it's like turning out the Lagrange points might actually not be that much cheaper to have anything there. I think the Lagrange points are only cheaper if you have a space elevator, but that's that's for another talk. We'll, we'll get later. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't delve <laughs> deep into it. I just saw it and thought it was cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So next section, page seven. This one is a brand new section. Okay. So this one is broken into into two parts. Okay. So the first part. I shall presently discuss the question as to who is to decide on the distinction between liberating and repressive human and inhuman teachings and practices. I have already suggested that this distinction is not a matter of value preference, but of rational criteria. Hmm. What do you think? Well, again, how does he define rational? That's kind of my concern. Like, again, going back to what I just said about Marxism and polylogism and all that, does he mean logic in the Aristotelian non-contradictory sense, or does he mean through the lens of the oppressed people, so it's what they want is considered proper and all that? That's what I would you know, wonder. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's that's key right here. You see, when he comes to like, okay, who is to decide this? Now this is yeah. parts where we start getting the things. You see, he set up the stuff before, and most of the stuff was agreeable. But yeah. now he starts setting up who is supposed to decide. And I think that's part of what's happening now yeah. is this certain people in society have said, wait, we can be the deciders. We yeah. can be the priesthood. I can be the pope of this. Like I can be the person you come to actually, to actually get your marching orders. That's yeah. part of why the older clergy didn't want the 
They didn't want the masses reading the books because you had no. to come to them. They were the yeah. vicar of Christ. They were the voice of God. Like they're the ones yeah. who are spoken, the chosen folk. So be very suspicious of people who think that. Be very suspicious of anyone who would tell you, yes, this is what Marcuse said, but don't go read what Marcuse said. <laughs> be suspicious of those people. Okay, continuing. But to refrain from violence in the face of vastly superior violence is one thing. To renounce a priori violence against violence on ethical and psychological grounds uh, because it might antagonize sympathizers is another. Nonviolence is normally not only preached uh, to by, to, sorry, it's not only preached to, but exacted from the weak. It is a necessity rather than a virtue. And normally, it does not seriously harm the case of the strong. Is the case of India an exception? Their passive resistance was carried through a, on a massive scale, which disrupted or threatened to disrupt the economic life of the country. Quantity turns into quality. On such a scale, passive resistance is no longer passive. It ceases to be nonviolent. The same holds true for the general strike. Robespierre's uh, distinction between the terror of liberty and the terror of despotism and his moral glorification of the former belongs to the most convincingly condemned aberrations, even if the white terror was more bloody than the red terror. The comparative evaluation in terms of the number of victims is a quantifying approach which reveals the man-made horror throughout history that has made that had made sorry, that made violence a necessity. In terms of historical function, there is a difference between revolutionary and reactionary, reactionary violence, between violence practiced by the oppressed and by the oppressors. In terms of ethics, both forms of violence are inhuman and evil. But since when is history made in accordance with ethical standards? This is, this is where that it really gets... That's very key, and that's something that James Lindsay brings up a lot in interviews as well, because this this is where you see the asymmetry that I talked about at the beginning. Why is left-wing violence excused, right-wing violence condemned? Why is it how, – how many people died in the BLM riots over the summer? No, you know, that was okay because this is in the name of the oppressed and all this. But then a few people die at the Capitol building. It's the worst thing ever. They're still having congressional hearings over it. So, again, th this is where this asymmetry comes from. And I know left-leaning people who have said this, like, oh, well, you know, these people are oppressed and they're fighting, so that's okay. This is excused. Never mind that BLM is mostly rich white kids and rakes in billions of dollars, but this is still an oppressed group, so that's okay. This is the angle they're coming from. So... I, I told another friend recently, I'm like, don't keep saying this is hypocrisy over and over. You get Understand this essay. Understand what Marcuse is arguing. When you understand this, you'll know the angle they're arguing from. Now, whether you agree with it or not, that's up to you. Obviously, I don't agree with it, but it's like it gives you insight into the angle that they're arguing from. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> that is that is the key thing. Yeah. Like he's, he's talking about that. This is he's clearly talking about that. <laughs> That's why people don't want to know yeah. who Trump supporters actually are. You can't actually yeah. know that Trump supporter is somebody who's living in a small in a small town who's 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 making maybe twenty five thousand dollars. He doesn't really have that good insurance. Even if they have some insurance, because they live in a small town, they don't have access to the top doctors. So they have certain chronic issues. They go without work. They 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 have that situation where they've had situations with with, um, with fentanyl. With with kind of with, these towns are kind of drying up. The, the jobs that go to other places. So you don't look at them as those humans because if you see no. them as that kind of person, then you yeah. can't say that person is an oppressor because who are they oppressing? Yeah. Who have they oppressed? There's not even black people out there for them to oppress to begin with. No. So like, like, how is that person the oppressor? Yeah. So when that person goes to uh, to um, D.C. on January 6th, because there was a president yeah. that actually spoke to them, you see that, and then you say any of the violence, even if it's, even if that's a fraction of violence compared to the entire months over the summer, because you are not envisioning any one of those people as an oppressed, you, that's no. the oppressor class, then any violence from them is abhorrent. Is this, yeah. no, it's inhuman, we can't treat that. But then when it goes, you don't, many of those liberals also, they don't know actual black people. They might know some black people that came out of those environments yeah. and like, oh, we're never going back. But they don't actually know the people in there. So they don't know the struggles that are within their yeah. own communities out there. Within those communities as well, it's also 95% black people. It's ran by black people in the politics. The, the parents are black, like, the schools are black. So yeah. who is actually oppressing them in that situation? But no, you have to kind of get that situation where like, no matter what, those are oppressed. So no matter what they do, they are the oppressed. So they're allowed to do anything they want to be violent. And it's just, it's a dehumanizing thing where I just, I'm just thinking like, and they, like you said, this to me is like, okay, this makes sense. I see why people I went to high school with, who it was a rather affluent area, 
I see them, yeah, we need to support this, we need to support Joe Biden, we need to support these kind of policies. And then I think about, okay, maybe they look at me and they're like, oh, I know a black person. I'm like, no, I just happen to be a Negro. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an average black person. <laughs> but so, so maybe they don't know. So it's, it's about, but I, I can imagine that they, some of them I know they've gone to schools and they've learned type of things that they would know this, this, this material. And if yeah. you agree with this, I can understand that. Like, yes, if you're an oppressed minority, yeah, you stand up. I don't look back at the colonists or the colonials and the, colon, the people who were being colonized in, in Kenya, it was 56 years ago when they got the independence. Yeah. I don't look at the violence by the colonists and the people who are up, the, the revolutionaries, in the same way. And that's why they have to have that dynamic. They have to be the revolution. They have to say they're the ones who are the revolutionary, reactionary. They have to yeah. adopt that struggle from the 1960s. They can't just yeah. be part of the masses and then just be picking this up. They have to put themselves no. in that rebel type of position. It's, it's a weird thing. Well, it's an interesting thing, too. I don't know if you ever saw that essay I posted, but... Um... There's a the woman, Peggy McIntosh, who coined the term white privilege, and she wrote an essay originally called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, but then there was an essay written called Unpacking Peggy McIntosh's Knapsack, and it talks about how <laughs> – well, it talks about how she came up with white privilege, but the thing is, she herself came from an extremely wealthy family. Like, she's from Summit, New Jersey, where I think the average income there is like three times the national average. Her father was one of the original, like – he, he was someone very prominent who did technology related to IBM and secured some major patents. Uh, she went to like private schools. She taught at Harvard, all this. So she's saying, oh, I have all this because I'm white. And it's like, you know, people in West Virginia, the Midwest, whoever are looking at this, like, I don't have access to any of this stuff. So they're wondering, like, is this some sort of guilt thing? Like she feels guilty about coming from all this money. So she's finding a way to rationalize it away with, well, I have all this because I'm white. It's like, yeah, there has been a time where it was definitely easier for white people to achieve that. But you look at people in Appalachia, Missouri, even the, even some areas around here, white people are not on average living like that, while minorities all live in poverty. So, again, I don't know if it's a misreading. I don't know if it's projection. Like, I'm trying to sort of get into what her motivations would be for saying all this, but it just – the empirical reality doesn't match what she's saying. Yeah. I think when it comes to that, there, there is this general thing where uh... – uh, there, there is a general nature of hypergamy and when it yeah. comes to the, the female species and just yeah. when, it, when it comes to female of the human species. And that's in general, we also look at people who are doing better than us rather right. than looking back at the past. Even just us, we look at how much better we can get rather than how much far, how far we've come from the past. That's, that's something yeah. that's, that's frequent. So we look at the people at the top, but we don't look at all the people. You know, you don't see the homeless person on the street, but you look at no. the, the Bentley driving by. So she has that kind of mentality, so she might be seeing that. And they also this in the thing where, oh, if we're part of the white race, that also big ups herself, even if she's not accomplished. Yeah. She's like, oh, I can be part of this, this special class of people. Yeah. But you look at the people at top, and then you see that, and you project that as being everybody else. And it's, it's, it's not a positive thing to do. I, I don't think no. it's, it's, it's good. No. And another thing I was thinking here, when he says something about talking about the Indian situation, again, this is something where I'm saying if he had lived today with more access about what was happening in there and understanding just how massive the effect of the caste system in India and its mm. own issues in there that are just horrific, where um, there was just this general thing, this, this thing where it's like, it's blame the white man for everything. Now, but specifically when he talks here, when he says it became, it, it stopped being passive resistance and became violent and like, no, no. nonviolence does not translate into violence. Like, not because you stop doing it. Like, I, I wrote here, like, if, one, if let's say one person is doing a sit-in, you decide, I'm just going to sit in in one location and say, look, I'm not, I'm not going to leave this, this place because you're saying this is blacks only. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to sit here. If 100 people come into that one place, it's still not violence. Now, if a million people happen to try to come to that location and still just sit there, it's still not violence. If you had that one person in a million different places... I mean, one person in a million different restaurants, it's still not violence. So what is this transition that he's saying, oh, if you do this thing, if you do it qu quantitatively, it becomes, it changes quality. No, no, no. The qualities of things stay themselves. Like it, it, those, There's no magical transition there. I, I don't understand what he was trying to get at with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, next, next excerpt. So on page eight. I suggested that the distinction between true and false tolerance, between progress and regression, can be made rationally on empirical grounds. The, re the real possibilities of human freedom are relative to the attained stage of civilization. They depend on the material and intellectual resources available to the respective stage, and they are quantifiable and calculable to a high degree. So are the stage of advanced, so at the stage of advanced industrial society, the most rational ways of using these resources and distributing the social product with priority to on the satisfaction of vital needs 
and with a minimum of toil and injustice. In other words, it is possible to define the direction in which prevailing institutions, policies, opinions would have. You no, know, it would have to be changed in order to improve the, and improve in order to improve the chance of a peace which is not identical with Cold War or a little hot war, and a satisfaction of needs which does not feed on poverty, oppression, and exploitation. Consequently, it also it is also possible to identify policies, opinions, movements which would promote this chance and those which would do the opposite. Suppression of the regressive ones is a prerequisite for the strengthening of the progressive ones. More key stuff here. Yeah. So again, what does he define as progress? It's important here to remember as you're reading this that this guy is a Marxist. So when he says freedom, he doesn't mean what a libertarian means. When he says progress, of course, progress towards what? That's something I always hammer leftists on today. I was like, progress towards what? Are you, you know, are you do you mean equity, you know, equity as they define it? Do you mean equality of outcome? Do you mean um, wealth redistribution, like you, we have to be clear what progress is here. I have a definition of what I have, I would probably a different vision of what counts as progress. So we have to be clear. But again, knowing that he's a Marxist, when I hear words like freedom, liberation, progress, I know what he's implying by that. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I was making a difference. So this, this thing happens in the United States of America. And when something bad goes on, like, oh, now we're like the third world. Oh, yeah. Texas has electricity out. Now we're like the third world. No, you're not like the third world. No. In the third world, most of the issues are due to the lack there of the actual use of the resources that are available and the actual systems. In the United States, in America, in the first world, it's mostly mismanagement of the systems. And that's what's what's mentioned here, where it's like yeah. things are not done. Once it's industrialized, it's mismanagement. It's a misallocation yeah. of things. In Kenya, it's just, there's no power <laughs> line to begin with. So it's not like the power is cut. There's just no power no. in certain places. So yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a massive difference. Yeah. But the key part, as we mentioned before, when they're talking about uh, the people who pretend they're not indoctrinated or don't even recognize indoctrination anymore, when they said, if truth is about logic and science, if, and they, remember we said there's some people who say it's not really about that. And here he said, I suggested that the distinction between true and false tolerance, between progress and regression, can be made rationally on empirical grounds. Now you think of those things, and then you yeah. think of the people who try to ask them for actual evidence. Yeah. You try to ask them for rationality, and they say, your rationality is evil, your logic is evil, you can't bring this white stuff to me, like that. you can't deny my experience. It's about how I feel. You can see that these, technically, it seems like these are the despots that Marcuse was talking about, yet they claim to be following Marcuse's thinking. Like, it's, it's a weird situation. There's some... <laughs> <laughs> like mental gymnastics going on in there that's just like what, what's going on here well this short of, this sort of shows too and I, I think i pointed it out especially in our cynical uh, theory series cynical theories series about how it sort of shows the contradictions between neo-marxism versus postmodernism because marxism is supposed to be a modernist philosophy it's supposed to be about reason logic science all that i mean marx said is socialism was scientific socialism so they're supposed to believe in those principles postmodernism is supposed to be all about subjectivity your my truth your truth all of that so i think they're trying to sort of walk that line if they're borrowing from both but it's kind of hard because on the one hand if you're touting logic rationality objectivity then on the other hand you're saying everything's subjective my truth your truth you can't really reconcile those two contradictory positions whether you subscribe to logic or not so I think that's sort of the challenge. And of course, some postmodernists like Thaddeus Russell has made this comment that he criticizes, he says the postmodernists are not responsible for the current insanity. It's Marcuse and company. But then others would say, no, it's a postmodernist too because of their subjectivism and all that. And that was sort of what Pluck, when Helen Pluckrose was debating Thaddeus, that's what she was talking about. She's like, well, no, but then why are they falling back on all this subjectivity on my truth, your truth, and all that? If you're truly a Marxist, you believe in modernism. You believe in rationality, science, all that, you're not going to fall back on subjectivity. But where is that subjectivity coming from? That's the challenge. But again, like you say, these people themselves, they're not indoctrinated. They don't realize they're indoctrinated. So maybe they don't see the contradiction. So, to the, or yeah. they know there's a contradiction and they just live with it. It's, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. because, because like you're saying, where, where are they going to actually talk about it? Because if you said like empirically, if you look at poverty, oppression, yeah. exploitation, those are things that you could empirically say this is yeah. the evidence. This is what it is, and these are the numbers. And you can go back to sixty-five. You can go back to eighteen hundreds. You can go back to in time and say, look, these people were 
poverty is something you can define. What is the general yeah. standard of life? And that's why they can't actually get to the point. Some of them just have the point where it's really tough for them to actually start discussing this stuff because it just fricassees the stuff in the mind. Because when you start thinking about the rational empirical grounds, poverty, oppression, exploitation, these things have reduced in a large amount. I think one of them maybe that is arguable, that's not that I say that might be some background radiation type of thing where we're subconsciously aware of this growth of the state. So that's a super predator that we can't really face. So it's it's kind of always constantly like spider sense is just like constantly on, but it's just very background because it's, it's not directly in your soup, but it's just somewhere buzzing in the background. So maybe you have that knowledge where they're feeling some of that oppression and exploitation in that sense. But when it comes to poverty, even poverty itself, it might be the kind of sense like, yeah, we might have more, we might have more credit, but is it the same worth, the inflation and things like that, the, the debt society that we're living in, Technically, maybe Americans are sort of aware that, yes, we might be living in this sort of wealth and these, with these resources, but we still are also the most indebted society to ever exist. So maybe they're feeling like technically, objectively, if you really come down to it, are they the poorest people ever or are they the wealthiest people ever? Like what, what is the situation? So there might be some parts where some people might be uneasy with that. But I think the vast majority of the active ones who actually go out and are vociferous about this, if you ask them about the actual empirical grounds, has poverty improved? Has oppression improved? Has exploitation in a practical sense? Mm -hmm. And those all have improved. We're living in a better time when it comes yeah. to those three things than when Mercuso was writing this. But that's why they have to go back to the time. They have to insist, no, we still live in a 1960s type of situation. Because yeah. that's the only way you can still actually follow this stuff and call yourself progressive and not realize that now you are the regressives. Yeah. Well, I was thinking too of like the pollution thing, like what you said about Alex Epstein a little while ago. Like, I remember I was debating this woman I used to work with who thought like pollution's the worst it's ever been. I'm like, you have no idea. I'm like, the night. Have you heard about <laughs> London? Have you heard about Lon Have you heard about London in the 19th century? Like, there were the river, the river, the the Thames going through London was so toxic. Like, people died just living near it. Like, that's how bad it was. The Hudson River. I mean, it goes you know through New York, but like they said, like upstate here like people used to swim in it and they'd get cancer and other things because because the uh general electric dumping chemicals and things like uh you know like i say the london air like there's pictures of new york city even from the 80s smog in the air and all that you don't see it now it's like i again what is your evidence for things that are worse than they have ever been like you can read alex epstein books book or listen to his show the evidence points in the opposite direction if if you know yeah okay you can debate china pollutes a lot more india but i mean the U.S., the West in general? No. I mean, things are a lot cleaner than they've been in decades. There's no evidence that things have gotten worse pollution-wise. Uh, uh. There was one video I, I made. It was, it was called, like, there's no empirical evidence that people need empirical evidence to believe they have <laughs> empirical evidence. They just, they just, they just yeah. think they, they, they do have the evidence worth. But as you were pointing out with Alex Epstein, another thing that he said in a recent show was he was talking about the future of oil with um, – Michael something, I forget the name. It was like three episodes ago. But he was talking about something where in London now, because of this move for this green energy, get away from the grid and things like this, be more organic, be more towards earth, people are starting to burn wood again. And that's actually raising the pollution. Because when you burn wood, there's actually like these particulates that go into the air and things like that. It's not really that positive. You look at a lot of deaths happening in developing countries because people do chop down wood and they... They build these small little heath fires with this wood and charcoal and things like that, and it causes methane and takes people on fire. It's deforesting major locations. So those are the kind of things where you have to think, like, hmm, maybe using propane, maybe using different kinds of forms of energy is actually more positive than this. So these are the, things, the considerations that people don't necessarily have. And when you look into the empirical evidence and you look into these things that he's talking about here, where you can look at something and you can say, we can calculate the actual cost for this. And these things are not, they're not, it's not convoluted. But it's also not common sense, but yeah. somewhat complicated to do some of these things. These are big numbers we're talking about these things. Some of these things are envisioning things in the scale of millions of people over tens and <laughs> of decades of years. So these are tough things to kind of grasp, I think, uh, where I understand for some people, we are trying to do our best. And I just think if, you, if that is your general need or general want, yeah. look into the information more. But again, it's also, as I said a few minutes ago, acknowledging the idea of trade-offs. Like, yeah, there's certain technology gives pollution, but it also creates cheaper, abundant energy. And I know there's a section in Epstein's book where he talks about the unreliability of certain power grids in certain developing countries. I think he cites Gambia, and he talks about, like, hospitals with women giving birth, power goes out. That's a scary thing. I mean, people yeah. who need 
electricity, they can't have it. And your their idea is, well, just build green energy everywhere. And it's like, you don't get it. Like, solar panels are expensive. You have to mine minerals, all this. And then they, they degrade over time. Like, it's not so simple. Like, you're, you're creating this, like, hypothetical perfect situation, but you have no idea how to get there, just like the socialists themselves, quite, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, just, just look into that effect. Yeah. I think I think it's yeah. if you if you care, do do take some little effort to look into that effect. Okay, yeah. next section. Mm. The question who is qualified? The question who is qualified to make all these distinctions, definitions, identifications for society as a whole, has now one logical answer, namely everyone, in the maturity of his faculties as a human being. Start. Let me start again. There's, sure. there's a lot of commas in this one. I think it's a bit older way of writing so some of the things. Like there were some really long sentences when I was reading. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. So the question, the question, who is qualified to make these distinctions, definitions, identifications for the society as a whole, has now one logical answer. Namely, everyone in the maturity of his faculties as a human being, everyone who has learned to think rationally and autonomously. The answer to Plato's educational dictatorship is the democratic educational dictatorship of free men. John Stuart Mill's conception of res publica is not the opposite of Plato's. The liberal too demands the authority of reason, not only as an intellectual, but also as a political power. In Plato, rationality is confined to the small number of philosopher kings. In Mill, every rational human being participates in the discussion and decision, but only as a rational being. When society has entered the phase of total administration and indoctrination, this would be a small number indeed, and not necessarily that of the elected representatives of people, of the people. The problem is not that of an educational dictatorship, but that of a breaking the tyranny. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of what... I'm not 100% sure what to think on this because I do, you know, when I read this essay, I think of Plato in general, like the idea of philosopher kings, like where the people who are supposed to wake up the proletariat, the blacks and everyone and, you know, wake them up to their oppressed status and help them overthrow the system. Um, of course, the classical liberal tradition is that no people have the right to decide again. Obviously, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. So there's certain safeguards in place and other ideas, checks and balances. Uh I'm not exactly sure. I think I think what he's trying to get at is ultimately both of those ideas kind of fail in that he's trying to get towards his ideal of a direct democracy, of course. Like I say, the challenge here is that he's trying to present it as being a very democratic idea when in fact what he's advocating is ultimately totalitarian because these ideas – equity does not emerge spontaneously so it has to be sort of cajoled into place that was ultimately what leninism was and that's sort of what this was inspired at least in part by the idea that well the masses are not going to wake up so we have to be the people who are going to sort of lead the masses to the promised land as it were but of course you need a lot of power and you ultimately need totalitarianism to do that so he's not saying that directly but i feel like that's what he's building up to yeah. Yeah, and you see, for some people, they look at that and they say, okay, we're trying to educate the people, and that sounds like a positive thing yeah. to have that situation where it comes down to, and that's, as an individualist, that's something with, with my, yeah. yeah, with my belief in individualism and holding that as, as a value, that's, that's positive when he's talking about, yes, the individual needs to come in and actually have that, but have that ability to actually be aware of things. If I'm not familiar with something, I don't want to vote on that because I don't understand. People in general also agree in that. People are not advocating that they should be able to vote in China, even if people in China aren't allowed to vote, because they're like, I don't understand what's going on in China. But why does somebody in Washington, Washington D.C. think they should have the vote over who runs what's happening in Texas when they don't know what's happening in Texas just as much as they don't really know what's happening in China? So when you have a system like that, what, what is the, the, the background to that kind of idea that's, that's actually sitting on that? And then the part here, the United States of America, as I mentioned before, has the biggest state ever. Then you have a situation where it's like 90% plus of the people, I think it was about 95 as we were talking in the Cracks in the Ivory Tower series, of K-12, through has been has had K-12 through education. Then you have about, I just checked, it was like 37% of people have a two to four year degree. So you have all these people. Now, if you count that as actual school instead of indoctrination, then you can argue that, yes, then that's why we should have a full democracy because you have almost the most educated population ever. But then when you look at the actual results of the people comparative to other yeah. classes and other places, and you see, are they really that educated? How many people get into college and need remedial classes of like English and math? So it's like, how educated are they? We recently had that conversation saying like, oh, the critical thinking as we're taught does not help. Like, don't go down the rabbit hole. 
if these people are being taught, like you have to train adults in a massive newspaper to say like, hey, if you read something, open a tab and double check and see, like we need to have fact checks on every single thing because people think, look at a meme and they believe it. So how effective is this? Are they, are we, are we living in a situation where we are in the situation where we have the full place? See, if it's not a phase of total, total administration and indoctrination, then to be small number indeed. So do they believe we're in that situation where society has entered a phase of total administration and indoctrination? That's what they think. So now they're thinking we are that small number indeed that we might not be elected and we can't let the people elect because they will choose people like Donald Trump who are just insane. So we have to find ways to maintain this small number indeed that has actually control to actually affect what's going to happen with these people in order to break this tyranny. That's, that's to me, is what I see some of these people yeah. reasoning for what the things, that for fortification of the election and things like that. Like, yeah. you can't leave the masses to them because they don't know better. It's, it's yeah. creepy. And but, but it's a strange thing, too, because like you right. say, what's that? That's what I'm saying. Like, are they right? Do you think they're right? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> because yeah, but, like, some but, of the things people believe, I'm like, well, yeah. But, that, but, but that's a strange... That, I, sorry. Sorry, but even if they even if they're right, I still don't think I should be the one to be a philosopher king or be the part of that small yeah. people who's telling them. I'd rather find ways to educate them. Yeah, Sorry. but the, but these are also the people, like we say, they go on and on about educated voters, and you know, I I always make the point. I'm like, the government already has you for 12 years. It's like you can't teach anyone anything in 12 years. I don't know. I mean, you know, culinary school I did in two years. I mean, there are people who go from like entry level cooks to running the kitchen in like under a decade. It's like. If you can't advance so far in a certain time, it's like, what are you doing besides hanging out with your friends and, you know, whatever? And it's like, if, if again, the left runs these institutions, it falls on them. You're the one who, you're the ones who are failing to teach people how to think. It's not conservatives. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's, that's, some, that's something here. But I think that's, that's a cool thing to think of. Why yeah. do you think they, they have this elite? Where they say, oh, the elite, trust the elite. It's because of that. It's some of them think, like, yeah, the other people are indoctrinated. So the elite, and you see, that's the thing. They can take different parts of it and say, this part we're going to apply it this way. This yeah. other part we're going to apply it that way. To the, it's 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 a it's a mix master of things, and that's something that you see is typical. That's done in religions. They take the dogma, they take the books that are the, the parts of it that are positive, and they flip. They say, okay, we're going to ignore those other parts. It's it's something humans do. Well, it you know it goes to that Time Magazine article that you keep citing too. It's oh, we're all about democracy. We're all about the people. Oh, well, Trump would have won. That would have been a threat to democracy if we rig things or sorry, fortify things in favor of Biden. That's true democracy. And again, go, going back to the Wall Street bets things, I see this with stocks too. Oh, you know, average people can get into stocks. This is great. All this people start making money. Oh, hold on, we may have to rein this in. Oh, you know, oh, we think this company is going to go out of business. So we're going to short the stock. All these people are buying it, drives it up. Hey, they're not supposed to be doing that. What is, what is this? People are making money. This isn't fair. So it's like you're you're <laughs> you're cherry picking different parts of like, oh, if we do this, it's clever. It's pro democracy. If they do it, it's somehow a bad thing. Even though the principle is the same, but you find ways to rationalize this as somehow this is a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like people they came out and said, okay, some some people just finally came out and pretty much yeah. admitted that yeah, this was not this this impeachment of this second impeachment of Trump was third impeachment after he was out of office, was not really about uh, taking him out of office. It was about preventing him from running again. And people are like, yeah. well, if he runs again, it's an assault on democracy. And I'm like, wait, yeah. you, you don't, for some reason, you, you argue that under Donald Trump's administration, even though he was a garbage human being, he was able to run the most secure election ever. But somehow you think under Biden and Democratic leadership, you're not going to be able to have a secure enough election, a fortified enough election that if people actually voted for Trump and he won, it would have been fair and actually part of democracy. You just automatically say, like, if Trump is the result equals no democracy, that's the kind of mentality that they're setting up in their minds. It's, yeah. it's a weird situation. Yeah, all right. Okay, next one. So page nine, we're getting towards the end here. Moreover, with respect to the latter, a policy of unequal treatment would protect radicalism on the left against that on the right. Can the historical calculus be reasonably extended to the justification of one form of violence against the other? Or better, since justification carries a moral connotation, is there historical evidence to the effect that the social origin of the impetus of violence from among the ruled or the ruling classes that have or have, the have or the have nots, the left or the right, is in a demonstrable relation to progress as defined above? With all qualifications of a hypothesis based on an open historical record, 
it seems that the violence emanating from the rebellion of the oppressed classes broke the historical continuum of injustice, cruelty, and silence for a brief moment. Brief but explosive enough to achieve an increase in the scope of freedom and justice, and a better and more equitable distribution of misery and oppression in a new social system. That's a disgusting sentence. Yeah. In one word, progress of civ in civilization. The English Civil Wars, the French Revolution, the Chinese and the Cuban revolutions may illustrate the hypothesis. In contrast, the one historical change from one social system to another, marking a new beginning of a new period in civilization, which was not sparked and driven by an effective movement from below, namely the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, brought along a long period of regression for, cent for long centuries until a new higher period of civilization was painfully born in the violence of the heretic revolts of the 13th century and in the peasant and laborer revolts of the 14th century. Yeah. It's interesting too, he brings up the English Civil War there because people forget that there were actual communist factions during the English Civil War. If you read um, <clears throat> Murray Rothbard's uh, Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought or also Alexander Gray's book, who he said was one of his favorites after Mises' own on socialism. The book is called The Socialist Tradition from Moses to Lenin. He talks about these various factors during the English Civil War, how uh, Oliver Cromwell was supposed to be the pro-democracy crowd, but there were also the level levelers, the diggers, they had different group, different names, and they were basically some, I guess they were sort of like these Christian utopian socialist types, and they, they wanted power then too. So it's kind of interesting he brings that up as well. That's, I feel like that's something that should be better known but doesn't get as much attention. And that's something I always <laughs> – but that's something I always use in conversation because people, pres people present Marxism like it's this brand new idea. I'm like, you have no idea. This stuff goes way back. I mean, you, you, know, you, you can go back past the 19th century. I mean, this was what – 1600s so that 17th century you can go back to even earlier than that you could argue sparta itself was kind of socialist you know it's like no the idea of okay we're going to advocate on behalf of a group that we think is oppressed and fight for their rights that's not some new idea that's been around for millennia <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's it's good that you went into there with the with the yeah. english revolution because when he yeah. talks about the english revolution talks about the french revolution First of all, those things come from an older time when history was written in a different way. So yeah. this whole idea of an open record, there is no open record of history. Even now, no. we are learning a lot more. We're living in a time where now, we're living in a time where we're, <clears throat> where we're living in, we're living in post-historical, where like it's, now you'll be able to hear all aspects of the things going on. If, they, if a war was to break out now, you'd hear pretty much all the information that was going on on both sides and all sides involved. Whereas yeah. in the past, it was like, okay, if you lost a war, chances are your history was wiped out and everything that was happening in your country at that time was burnt and destroyed. So people didn't really understand where you were coming from in that whole aspect. Yeah. But that's something that can happen now. So when you're talking about the French and English revolutions, or the English Civil War and the French Revolution, first of all, those were a lot older. So you yeah. can see how they've actually grown in history. During the time that you were speaking, the Chinese and Cuban revolutions had just began. And I was wondering if he actually lived now, if he was actually aware of things like the Holodomor, if he's actually aware of the Great Leap Forward, if he's aware of the result of the Cuban Revolution, would he still consider those to be actual things to bring up? And like, yeah, this is this is what's what's positive. You know, they come up a, a grassroots type of thing that they come up to put the Chinese and Cuban revolutions in the same group as the English Civil Wars and the French Revolution, to me, does somewhat injustice to what the French Revolution and the Civil Wars kind of did in effect. And maybe there's some issues like, oh, they started democracy, the Frenchies, and ah, ah. <laughs> But they've come all the way to the point where they just recently imprisoned, um, uh, what was it, Sarkozy for some, yeah. I think he got like a one-year jail term and two years served or something. It'll be, an, it'll be in a posh kind of prison. He might yeah. be home in prison. But it's still something. Arrested. You can still see the advancement. But look at the difference between China and France today, which country is more free? Like, and that yeah. that might have taken those hundreds of years for the French Revolution to actually get to that point where China hasn't had that. So to to put those together, it's 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 suspicious. And he's also when he's talking about Rome, how much information do we have about Rome? Then I think even during the sixties, we've learned so much more about what happened in Rome, and a lot of the things that were actually part of why the Roman Empire collapsed are some of the things that's happening in the United States of America 
the the cultural issues within the United States of America, the, the the elites kind of getting up where they're separated from the people, the the growth of the military state over expanding themselves, the opening of the borders and things like this, where they're coming in and diluting the general culture of the structure that actually developed the nation. There, there was issues that are happening that are, that are, might be similar to some of the things that we're seeing in the United States of America that might not have been. He might not have seen them as comparatively as we might do right now. I don't know. What do you think about this? Well, it's kind of weird, too, that he glorifies the French Revolution, because if you think about it, there's a whole reign of terror. Robespierre got, you know, he executed Danton. Uh, that was one of the guys who started it. And then, you know, when Robespierre was killed, they even said, well, sorry, when Robespierre was on trial, they even said, you choke on Danton's blood because, you know, he had his friend killed. And then Robespierre's own people turned on him because things got out of control. You know, I know he got shot in the face with a shotgun. They said he lived the last few hours of his life. His jaw hanging off got guillotined. And then there was a power vacuum and then Napoleon took power. So it's like, was this some glorious thing? I'm not really sure it was. I mean, yeah. you could you could, ar you could argue, okay, the... Bourbons, Louis the Sixteenth, they had their problems, but like, look at what took their place. And it was the same. It was the same thing with Russia, obviously. I mean, Nicholas, it, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say he was a saint, but if you look at who took over after him, he was vastly preferable. So it's, you know, I, I don't think these should be held up as some sort of glorified thing. Uh, or I think it's one of those, unless it's one of those things where he's just praising the intentions over the actual results. Like, well, they fought for the people, you know. <laughs> And that might be it. Maybe it's the intentions where he says, okay, if you look at France and the and England in the time span, so the revolutions were happening in the 60s in Cuba and China. Yeah. So if you look at, let's say, it was the, the French Revolution, I, let's say, I, where was it? I forget the dates. But if you look at 10 or 10 or 10 to the, the 50 years after, right after it happened, the country wasn't as good as it is today. So maybe he's thinking, oh, even if China was, is going through what it's going through now, because there was a similar sort of revolution, there's a similar sort of civil wars going on that a hundred years down the line is going to be great. But the French didn't have nuclear weapons and have the world's industries and have the ability to track people with with <laughs> super technology and have the ability to like harvest people's parts. Like, those those were not things that were going on. So we, we can't just say, oh, because Europe had the hundreds of years to actually develop. We should let these other places have it. It's a different kind of reality. Yeah. And also China and Cuba have the, ex have the example of what Europe went through to learn from. Africa doesn't have to go through, African countries don't have to go through the same kind of mess ups, the same kind of corruption, the same kind of issues, because they can look at these other countries and say, okay, did, did that really work? Let's not try that. Let's try and adopt these better ways of doing things. So that's, that's something that I think I think was it was interesting to see where what would he have changed if he had different kind of information I think. Well, and that's I think I made the comparison contrast too but between uh, Pinochet and Castro, where if you look at the New York Times, they'll say Castro was this brave hero who fought for his people and you know no, died nobly and all this. It's like okay, well, and then Pinochet, it's monstrous dictator, violator of human rights, but then it's okay. Um. You know, Castro killed even more people, wrecked his nation's economy, died a dictator, left his brother in charge. Pinochet transformed his country's economy, returned the country to democracy and stepped down. It's like, you know, yes, he, he was not a saint. He killed people, too. But it's like there's this double standard. And I think Marcuse is sort of leading into a similar thing where it's, well, these people are closer to my ideal. So I'm going to look the other way on some of their mistakes. Yeah. yeah and that's the dichotomy he sets here. So yeah. from among the ruled and the ruling classes, the have or the have-nots. And then the left and the right. You see, he has the ruled, the have-nots, yeah. and the left on one side. Then yeah. the ruling classes, the have, the haves. No, so we say the have and the have-nots. So there he switches. Or yeah. say ruled on one side, the have on one side, then the left on one side. So he's just going back and forth. But he's taking yeah. the dichotomy. So it's so the left and the right. So where would he put the left in that? Would you consider the left maybe when he was writing this as the have-nots and the ruled and the ruled? Yeah, he would consider them maybe at that time the ruled and the have-nots. Yeah, and the right at that time of him writing would have been <clears throat> the haves and the ruling classes. But right now, can you truly argue that the left right now is the ruled and the have-nots? I don't think you can truly no. argue that anymore. No. So that's I think again I think that's why they have to mentally take themselves back to that time. Yeah, because. I agree with his general contention that saying that mm -hmm. violence that's emanating from the ruling class will not lead to progress because the ruling class, if they're going to have violence, why would they fight for progress? Because in general, progress might improve their lot. It might maintain their lot. 
But there's a chance it will cost them being in ruling status. If you're already on the top, why would you fight to change things? If, if you yeah. fight anything, you'd probably be fighting to maintain the status quo. And yeah. I think that's why they have to completely deny that they actually are the ones who are in the ruling class. Because it, yeah. it's and that's a weird thing that you see these people like Bill Gates, you see the people like, <laughs> like Jeff Bezos, you see the people like Nancy Pelosi, who are elites, who are ruling class. And somehow people think they're the... They're the ones who are going to be on the right side of the history and fighting for the little man. It's a weird thing going on here. It's it's really odd. I don't get it. Yeah, so <laughs> like, I, like I said before, I don't know if it's a lack of self-awareness. I don't know if it's grifting and they're just they're framing it this way to gain money and power for themselves i mean you i think it would you would have to look at it on an individual basis but it's like it doesn't add up for me at all huh? yeah all okay right. so uh we've got two more pages going i think we should be able to get this done in one video just uh, sure. that, i guess three more sections three okay. okay liberating tolerance oh sorry liberating tolerance then would mean intolerance against movements from the right and toleration of movements from the left yeah. as to the scope of this tolerance and intolerance it would extend to the stage of action as well as of discussion and propaganda, of deed as well as of word. The traditional uh, criterion of clear and present danger seems no longer adequate to a stage where the whole society is in the situation of the theater audience when somebody cries fire. It is a situation in which the total catastrophe could be triggered off any movement, not only by a technical error, but also by rational miscalculation of risks or by a rash speech of one of the, the leaders. In past and different circumstances, the speeches of the fascist and the Nazi leaders were the immediate prologue to the massacre. The distance between the propaganda and the action, between the organization and its release on the people had become too short. But, spreading of the, but the spreading of the word could have been stopped before it was too late. If democratic tolerance had been withdrawn, when future leaders started the, the campaign, mankind would have had a chance of avoiding Auschwitz and a world war. So again, this goes to the more radical take on the paradox of tolerance of it's not enough to use violence once they become violent, we have to stamp them out before they even come to fruition. And I, I don't know if you have the section here, but there was a section somewhere in the essay where he talks about pre-censorship. So the idea that we send, we don't even allow things to be spoken and then censor them, we prevent them from being able to even be spoken today. And you see that with the progressives in cancel culture now where, oh, you can't go listen to these people speak. They have to be prevented from even coming. It's the same idea. Yeah, that's in the next <laughs> section, the yeah. next excerpt. But the thing I wanted to point out from this other part we read is that's why they must they must put themselves as a left. Because you see now he's already just yeah. dropped and said like, yes, this is why we have to, this, is, this would mean intolerance against movements on the right and toleration of movements on the left. So yeah. You see, that's liberating intolerance. That's what he's saying, liberating intolerance. So that would mean yeah. you have to be intolerant to the right and tolerate all movements to the left. So yeah. that's why they must frame themselves as a left. Yeah. And here he literally said the Nazis and the Austrian and the fascists. That's why Trump has to be a Nazi. That's why the, the conservatives have to be the fascists. That's why they can't be the National German Socialist Workers Party. They can't admit that because, hey, we're for the workers. We're socialists. Eh, yeah. That's what the Nazi party was. Oh, yeah. we're for big government controlling, like having working together with Twitter and being able to call Twitter and say, should, you should ban this person. That is fascist. You're controlling yeah. industry. Oh, we should be able to say these people can't do work with these people. Oh, we have to put these tariffs. That is fascist type of stuff. But yeah. they can't admit that themselves. You have to keep this kind of di di this this. You have to keep this this character of who is what and what is yeah. who, and that's how they can be on the right side of history by by going that. And it's creepy how, and we're getting towards the end. You can see how some of the stuff started kind of reasonable, and now he's just switched. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's the left, that's the right. And this again, with the knowledge that he had at that time, might have been accurate. He at that time did not have as much information about how Hitler was actually appeased. I don't know if he. I think the rise and fall of the Third Reich might have been written at that time. But when I read it at that time, the stuff that Hitler was doing is similar to kind of the stuff that Xi Jinping is doing. Like, it's yeah. just weird how like, we're appeasing certain things. So with that aspect, I agree. Yes, some of these things, you can nip them in the bud earlier. But is Trump really Hitlerian? No, he's not. No. But to them, they imagine he is. That's why they can cheer if he's taken down from Twitter when yeah. to you, it's just like, ah, he's doing funny tweets. Because to them, it's literally Hitler writing Mein Kampf by like 240 characters a tweet at a time. 
that's what they think is going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you have to realize that's what they truly believe, as truly as you might believe that Jesus was buried for three days for three days and then yeah. went out to that's how that's how truly they believe these things to the core of their heart. So that's that's something to kind of understand. James Lindsay has a very good video. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's kind of long. I think he has an essay too that's a bit kind of long, but the video about pseudo realities, how there are certain ideologies that people become so invested in, they think that the ideology describes reality, but it really doesn't. But they behave according to that perception of reality. And what's interesting too is that as critical as James is of the postmodernists, he said their critiques of this are actually the best in the world. Because if you look at like ancient Greece or something, we know Zeus didn't exist. We know Hades didn't exist. But there were people who lived thinking, oh, there's a storm. That's Poseidon. Oh, sorry, that's mm -hmm. Zeus throwing thunderbolts. Oh, the waves are moving. Oh, that's Poseidon blowing or whatever. But like there are people who they live their lives according to these narratives, thinking that these are real, when of course reality doesn't bear that out. Now, where the postmodernists get it wrong is that they think everything is pseudo-reality. They, they think all of this is socially constructed, when no, reality, there are objective truths or else why, what is science, what is logic, all that. But their critiques of it are excellent because they saw how people do this, and that's exactly what I feel these people do. Again, whether they're following Marcuse or the postmodernists, they actually think we're fighting for the little oppressed people against the evil oppressive system when the empirically it's not borne out at all. Oh. Yeah. I mean, that's well said. Well, I'll yeah. check that out. I've, I've heard yeah. you mention that before. And I, I thought that's pretty much what, what you've explained yeah. is pretty much what I thought he was meaning. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the part where you, you had mentioned the pre-censorship. It's in this section. Sure. Okay. So on page 10, when tolerance mainly serves the protection and preservation of a repressive society, when it serves to neutralize opposition and to render men immune against other and better forms of life, then tolerance has been perverted. And when this perversion starts in the mind of the individual, in his consciousness, his needs, when heter heteronomous interests occupy him uh, before he can experience his servitude, then the efforts to con contract his dehumanization must begin at the place of entrance. There where the false consciousness takes form, or rather, it is systematically formed. It must begin with stopping the words, the words and images which feed his consciousness. To be sure, this is censorship, even pre-censorship, but openly directed against the more or less hidden censorship that permeates the free media. Where the false consciousness has become prevalent in national and popular behavior, it translates itself almost immediately into practice. The safe distance between ideology and reality, repressive thought and repressive action, between the word of destruction and the deed of destruction, is dangerous, dangerously shortened. Thus, the breakthrough, uh, the false, sorry, thus the breakthrough, the false uh, consciousness might may provide the Archimedean point for a larger emancipation, at an infinitesimally small spot, to be sure, mm -hmm. but it is on the enlargement of such a such spot that the chance of change depends. Yeah. Well, false consciousness, there's the Marxism right there, the idea that people have been indoctrinated by the bourgeoisie to think they're happy and well off when they're actually oppressed. But don't worry, here we come along to teach them otherwise. It's the same idea, basically. And um, <clears throat> similar idea. And it's interesting, too. They always, the left always talks about dehumanizing people. I thought of what you just said about the Trump supporters. Aren't they always dehumanizing, you know, oh, these people are fascists. Oh, I, you know, the woman... There was that guy who got killed, got shot, and where was it, Seattle or somewhere, and that woman said, I'm not sorry that effing fascist died tonight, things like that. It's like, what are you doing to your opponents? But you have to caricature your opponents as actual fascists, and, well, they're not worthy of life because fascism is the worst thing ever. So it's interesting that these are the people who always go on and on about dehumanizing people when they do literally that. Uh. Yeah, and then I was thinking, where, where was he coming from on this? And Maybe in Europe in the 1800s, I'm trying to think of, it was the Prussian school system already involved where he was growing up, where maybe there was a lot of uh, schools that were in control of the church, which is more conservative. Maybe yeah. there was a lot more right-wing type of government. So he might yeah. have had that indoctrinated into him. And then maybe in the United States of America, there was still some of that with the Christian right having a lot more control over the social uh, landscape and things like that. So maybe there was that all aspect where they thought at that time, yeah, we need to actually enter. And they said, here, you have to get in at the start. You have to get in before all this stuff happens. It's pre censorship. So they say we have to get into the schools because to fight this right wing type of fascist ideology, we have to get in there. But then they yeah. did that 
if they were doing that for that original positive reason, now they have become the ones who are indoctrinating and controlling. So there, there is that aspect in there. And if he says here, he says, yes, it's an infinitesimally small spot, but it grows. That could be what happened. Maybe it's infinitesimally small spot started there, and then now it grew into what it is. But can't you say that about other things that are positive? Like you yeah. can say that instead of censoring free speech, because you say, okay, we have to censor it if it's in this kind of situation that we live in where, they, where people don't understand. They said, even if you censor and then you enter and you start affecting this free censorship, it will start and grow. But if you just let the free speech happen, even if you're in this area of danger, that could also infinitesimally small start and then eventually grow by itself without having to go through the process where you have to become that demon, where you go into the pre-censorship and you go into authoritarianism, where you go into the violence for the sake of peace. So it's kind of just, they're saying like, oh, uh, they use violence to, to shut us down, so we need to use violence to shut them down and then we'll be able to tell them the truth. It's like, no, just start speaking the truth and then your infinitesimal way might grow and, and, and end up flourishing, I, I think. And that and that goes to that status I did a while back that you did a video out of about they they like you know oh libertarianism can't survive outside of an echo chamber it's like well why are we the ones willing to engage why are we the ones you know encouraging people to read our stuff these people are trying to silence anything that disagrees with them it's like and they they'll say well we're preventing fascism it's like well one they define anything as fascism too. I, you can't really compare the U.S. to Germany. I mean, there's too many – culturally, it's way different. I mean, the history is a lot different. You know, more checks and balances here. Like, it's not really an accurate comparison. Like, I get, okay, maybe after World War II ended, he was nervous that this could happen again. He was trying to think of how to prevent it. But it's not really – it's an apples to oranges comparison, though, America to Germany. It's not really yeah. fair. Yeah. It sounds like the same people who just look at Africa and say, oh, it's Africa. Yeah. I mean, how are you in Africa? I'm like, Africa is a massive place. Like, yeah. <laughs> you could ask yeah. me how it is in Nairobi. I can't yeah. tell you how it's going in Mombasa, which is like a part of Kenya. It's like, it's a massive place. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But maybe because they live in the United States of America, they think, okay, it's all one country. But even in that case, it's not. But, so yeah. they also look at Europe and they oh, it's just Europe. No, Europe is a very yeah. diverse place. And the 1800s Europe is an entirely different place than 1965 United States of America, let alone 2020 United States of America. Yeah. Okay, so we're on to the last page, and this one, like, I pretty much, I think I, I, <laughs> I think I might have put an excerpt of the entire page, but this is the last one, and this is the combination of it, and I think these are, you'll, you'll see why, why, uh, why I've done this. And thank you for listening, if you've been coming along with us on this journey. Okay. Education still offers examples of spurious, abstract, tolerance, sorry. <clears throat> Education offers still another example of spurious, abstract tolerance in the guise of concreteness and truth. It is epitomized in the concept of self-actualization. From the permissiveness of all sorts of license to the child, to the constant psychological concern with the personal problems of the student, a large-scale movement is under, underway against the evils of repression and the need for being oneself. Frequently brushed aside is the question as to what has to be repressed before one can be a self, oneself. The individual potential is first a negative one, a portion of the potential of his society, an aggression, guilt feeling, ignorance, resentment, cruelty of uh, cruelty which vitiate his his life instincts. If the individual of the self is to be more than the immediate realization of his potential, undesirable for the individual as a human being, then it requires repression and sublimation, consciousness trans transformation. Mm -hmm. This process involves at each stage to use, sorry, this process involves at each stage to use the ridicule terms which here reveal their succinct correctness, the negation of the negation, mediation of the immediate, and the identity is no more and no less than this process. Alienation is the, the constant and essential element of identity, the objective side of the subject and not as it is made to appear today, a disease, a psychological condition. Freud um, well knew the difference between progressive and regressive, liberating and destructive repression. The publicity of self-actualization promotes the removal of the one and the other. It promotes existence in that immediacy, which, is, which in a repressive society is, to use another Hegelian term, bad immediacy. Schlechte unit unmittelbarkeit. It isolates the individual from the one dimension where he could find himself from his political existence, which is at the core of his entire existence. Instead, it encourages nonconformity 
and letting go in ways which leave the real engines of repression in the society entirely intact, which even strengthen these engines by substituting the satisfactions of private and personal rebellion for more than private and personal, and therefore more authentic opposition. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because you say that I was thinking I was thinking of Hegel a lot when he talks about things like alienation and negation because that's basically what Hegel's Aufhebung is, or uh, it's also called Aufheben. Basically, if I understand it correctly, it's something like the idea of you're negating something but keeping it but altering it. That's part of the dialectic, you know, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So the idea is like, okay, you have the Catholic Church. Martin Luther comes along; he's the antithesis he breaks from the church, you have a new Protestant church and the Catholic church is still exists. So that that's yeah. an example of that. I think it's a sort of a similar thing here. I think the idea that <clears throat> we, you know, we still have freedom, we still have democracy, but it transforms in a way that's more equitable. I think that's sort of the argument that they're making. That's how things are supposed to progress. But of course, what is his vision for how that should happen? What, and what does that entail? That's the thing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and here he's talking about he said, from the permissiveness of, of all sorts of license in the child to the constant psychological concern with the personal problems of the student, a large-scale movement is under the way against the evils of repression and the need to be oneself. So you see, he's saying the large-scale movement is underway against the evils of repression and the need to be oneself. So is, is what he's saying here is education offers an example of spurious abstract tolerance of the guys. So the guys are concrete as the truth. So when he's saying it is epitomized in the concept of self-actualization. So when he's talking about this, he's saying the permissive of license. So let the child do anything. If a child says she he says it's a female, if this boy says he's a female, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a girl. Let him, let him cut his balls off. That kind of thing. It's like the constant psychological concern with the problems of the student. The students are like constantly like, we it's racist. We need these hug boxes. Give him the hug boxes. So is he considering that to be a positive thing or is he considering that to be a negative thing when, when he's talking about it in that way? That's the other thing that's I was a bit suspicious. I, I feel like he's kind of talking out both sides of his mouth because on the one hand, he's talking about self-actualization, but it's I want people to agree with my ideology. So it's like if everyone just goes along with what you want, is that self-actualization? I wouldn't consider self-actualization be everyone being independent and coming to their own conclusions. If you just want everyone to come along with you, that's not self-actualization, that's conformity. So, um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure what he was arguing for here. Uh. And then here he talks about, okay, so he says, um, the individual potential is first a negative one, a portion of uh, the potential in his society, of aggression, guilt feeling, ignorance, resentment, cruelty, which vitiate his life. This is kind of a thing that people focus on. They focused on violent uh, outbursts and things like that. Their white guilt, that feeling, their ignorance to the experiences of other people's lives and things like that. Say, oh, you can't know this person's life. If you say, oh, you have to be X in order to know what it is to be X, then why why would Y care about what X has to say? Because like I can never know what that person is thinking, so I'm just going to stay ignorant to that. The resentment is there, resentment of history, resentment of other people, that's that's definitely there. And cruelty, which is a constant thing, there's a lot of cruel people on the political left. So those are the kind of things, again, political left is a political left. There's a lot of cruel regressives out there. So the, those are the kind of things where I'm saying, like, I was just thinking, like, have these people actually read this stuff? Or do they find ways, they, I talk to Christians, I talk to Muslims, I talk to people in other, other belief systems who haven't read their, their original, their, their founding text, but they, oh, they'll quote me certain parts. You know, he, they, they might just say this part, he's something else that was meaning something else. Because what's going on? In the end here, he says, this whole aspect of people saying, um, he, he, the, the last sentence here, I think he says, which even strengthen these engines, when you have that whole situation of rebellion for more than a private and personal and therefore a more authentic opposition. So is he saying, um, instead it encourages non-conformity conformity, and letting go in ways which leave the real engines of, impression, of repression in the society entirely intact, which even strengthen these engines by substituting the satisfactions of private and personal rebellion for more than, the, than private and personal, and therefore more authentic opposition. So is he saying that if you just rebel on a private and personal sense, as an individual snowflake or an ind individual individualist itself, and you say, I'm going to take myself out of this, then that's negative because you allow the system to occur? Or does he say when you do that by yourself, you let the other people who are willing to take the system, you keep using the system? Which one is he saying is more authentic? Like the more than private, the social collective 
general kind of rebellion versus I have to protest on behalf of other people rather than what is your actual personal situation? I, I don't know. Well, that, that's what I don't get too. is like, is he saying that if everyone, is it the whole, is it the whole Marxist thing of class consciousness and critical consciousness that if we wake people up, they'll be self-actualized and achieve the critical consciousness and class consciousness, and then they'll overthrow the system or is it, is but we have to help bring that about. Like I'm, I, I feel like that's the argument he's making. That we're the ones who have to wake people up. Because remember, like I said, the Frankfurt School was heavily involved with Freudianism too, because they were trying to marry Marxism with Freud to a point. And the idea that people have these this false consciousness, but we have to wake people up. We have to achieve critical consciousness, and then that self actualizing them, then they'll overthrow the system. I think that's the angle he was arguing from, but I'm not 100%. And you see, you know, you, like I've said before, you see that with the other things today, like internalized whiteness or internalized misogyny. Oh, men have taught you to hate yourself, but come to these consciousness raising sessions and we'll teach you how you're really oppressed and you'll rise up and overthrow the system. I think it's sort of that angle. Yeah. And that's part of why they can say, like, okay, I yeah. may be a white privileged person, but I will go protest on behalf of the poor oppressed black people because my rebellion is more than private and personal. It's yeah. it's it's something that's bigger. It's more authentic. Yeah, and it's a more authentic opposition to the machine. Maybe that's the thing that that leads them to get to that point. I I, I guess I can see that kind of reading of it. Yeah. All right. All right. So one last section. This is uh, three short paragraphs, shorter paragraphs than we've had before, before we finish off. The altered social structure tends to weaken the effectiveness of tolerance towards dissenting and oppositional movements and to strengthen conservative and reactionary forces. Equality of tolerance becomes abstract, spurious. With the actual decline of dissenting forces in the society, the opposition is insulated in small and frequently antagonistic groups who even when tolerated within the narrow limits set by the hierarchical uh, structure of society are powerless while the, are powerless while they keep within these limits. But the tolerance shown to them is deceptive and promotes coordination. And on the firm foundations of a coordinated <clears throat> society, all but closed against qualitative change, tolerance itself serves to contain such change rather than to promote it. The regressive are more reactionary than progressive liberal leftists. Conservatives are not the general right or Republicans. Oh, that was, sorry, those are my notes. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so and, and that's what we're finishing off as at, at the fact. I was like, really, that seems like a weird sentence for the person to write there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like, and the firm foundations of coordinated society are all but closed against qualitative change. So tolerance itself serves to contain such change uh, rather than than promotes it. So what were we thinking of that? Or should I reread this again? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's the usual thing of, oh, the conservatives run everything, where the oppressed, we have to overthrow the system. Like, I, I was just thinking to myself that it this is what James Lindsay was describing, how if a woke person reads this today, they're basically describing themselves, you know, where they're supposed to get their way. We're expected to go along with what they want. They cancel you if you don't. It's like, they you know, it's, it's again, it's a Nietzsche thing of gazing into the abyss. It's like they've become the establishment. They're the ones say they're the ones who are doing the very thing they're condemning. Yeah. Uh, I think here, with that first sentence, the reason I was writing that was when it says here, okay, the altered social structure tends to weaken the effectiveness of tolerance towards dissenting and oppositional movements and tends to strengthen conservative and reactionary forces. So thinking when you look at who is called conservatives right now, I don't think those people would fit people like Republicans in general. Or I don't think they'd even fit someone like Sir Roger Scruton, who gave one of the great yeah. best uh, def definitions of conservatism. I think I have that somewhere on my channel. And that doesn't really seem to be. They're, they seem to be more like alt-right type of people. Those yeah. aren't necessarily what I would consider conservatives. And also, no. when you look at the Black Lives Matter type of people, the Antifa type of people, these regressives are more reactionary than the progressive liberal leftists. Yeah. Even... I don't even think like an AOC type. She's at least going through the system somehow. Like she's yeah. not as on the left and reactionary as some of these Antifa type of people. Those people are the people. And I think that's what he's talking about here. The altered social structure has weakened effective tolerance against dissenting and oppositional movements. And that's the, 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 the mid people, the people in the middle who I think can have conversation, that ability to tolerate each other has seemed to be reduced because of the structure that you actually exist in. I think the people in power they maintain that whole situation of having that antagonism between the masses. But it has also strengthened the people on the side because now the people on the side who are a lot more into it, 
can look at the general level of disagreement in the masses and act on that and say that's how persecuted we are, or they focus on the few things, and those two fringes have been strengthened by this kind of system. And I think that's something yeah. to be concerned about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And, so and last like, yeah. like you just say, it just gets into even like what is left versus right, because like people complain about Trump and stuff, and they were like, "Oh, I, I want a more moderate Republican Party," but I'm like, "Yeah, you just want the Republicans to become Democrat light, and that's not conservative. That's just okay. We do what the Democrats did ten years ago, and it's like, yeah, I understand that because then the Republicans are basically a controlled opposition for you. But there are people who value limited government, fiscal responsibility, all that. But that's the antithesis of what you want. So naturally, you're going to condemn that at every turn. Yeah, because yeah, Trump activated a lot of people who hadn't voted before, who hadn't voted yeah. Republican. There was, was a lot of support for him in that kind of sense. Yeah. And you look at the actual, just the policies and things like that, if you take away his personality and you ask a lot of people who are Democrats, who would agree with a lot of those policies and things yeah. like that. It's just they managed to tie it towards, a, towards this character of this distasteful human being that was literally Hitler. And I think that was unfortunate. And um, I, it's just, it's been an unfortunate state of affairs. Okay. Yeah. So last paragraph. Sure. Law and order are always and everywhere the law and order which protect the established hierarchy. It is nonsensical to invoke the absolute authority of this law and this order against those who suffer from it and struggle against it, not for personal advantages and revenge, but for their share of humanity. There is no other judge over them than, is, than the constituted authorities, the police, and their own conscience. If they use violence, they do not start a new chain of violence but try to break an established one. Since they will be punished, they know the risk and they are willing to take it. No third person, at least all of the at least all the educator and sorry, at least of all the educator and the intellectual has the right to preach them abstention. Mm. Now there I just think like you can see the general reaction to these mostly peaceful protests from the yeah. intelligentsia yeah. class, from the educated people from the white yeah. well-off people from the yeah. schools and the intellectuals saying we can't talk against that but if whatever happened on january 6th we can talk about that because those are not the oppressed those are yeah. the oppressor class but everything else is just a reaction to the violence that's occurred so for them they that's why you see so much silence so when people are wondering why are people freaking out about what happened on january 6th which was horrible in its own way but completely downplaying all that happened in the summer because of this. <laughs> well, I was just gonna, I, well, I was just going to say, too, that's where the whole silence is violence, complicity is violence. That's where this comes from, because the idea that if you don't act out, speak out against systemic racism, all that, you're upholding the status quo. Like not, It's not even you're being actively racist, but you being inactive is upholding that status quo. And if you act out against it, you're tearing down the status quo in favor of the in, in a desire to liberate the oppressed. That's that's where this whole narrative comes from. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, like, hmm. I just feel I feel a lot better after after having read this. It's like, yeah. okay, I understand this. Now we're going to go into yeah. human action suit, which is going to be the an, another great great part. But just the fact that I'm looking these parts of society, then like, why why are they acting this way? Then I'm like, oh, if they think this stuff, if they read this stuff, that makes sense. Yeah. Why they would behave this way? Because some of this I can see this coming from this. So for me, just getting that information to me is is positive. It's just, it's just getting to know more. It doesn't mean it's any less dangerous, but it makes me better equipped to deal with the threats that I think come from this. Like, And I can see who's actually really about this, who's really into the actual content, and who's just going along with it. And you'll realize, I think, if you've been following this, if you've listened to it yourself, and you try to talk to people, you'll realize most people don't really believe the things that they say. They just kind of say it because they don't really, it doesn't really cost them much to actually yeah. just say yeah. that thing. They're just going along. So when it comes down to the the threats that society seems to be facing, very few people, even, even if you go back to like the literal Nazis, very few people had actually sat down with Hitler and read through Mein Kampf and been like, yeah, I agree with that, the final solution, all that. They're kind of just going along because that's what humans do. That's what life forms do. You just kind of go along with things. You just amble alone. You're just sort of dying alive. You're just, you're just trying to find ways to not be dead the next hour. That's how most people kind of go through life. And as was mentioned earlier here, when you get to a society where people start getting more comfortable, they start getting more into this stuff, you hear the stuff about the indoctrination, people just kind of going with what's there. If you actually get the people to actually get them in a position and hit them in somewhere where they're familiar with and actually engage with them, you'll find that people are in general reasonable, or you can find the small amount of people that are unreasonable 
and address them, you can seclude them or sequester them, quarantine them, find ways to address that. And then the, the rest of the people, the general populace of the people will come along with a positive, more, the more, the more pro-human flourishing ways, because that's what people want to do. They just think, Marcuse was doing this, not saying like, he's not somebody like a Malthusian who's like, oh, we need the world to be 2 billion people. That's the, the carrying capacity of the earth. For him, I think he was just in general just saying, to get a better life. Earlier on, he said something where I said it was kind of a disgusting statement where he said the improvement by that was spreading misery to people. I don't think that. I see that as a no. reduction of the misery yeah. that was spread. Because in general, misery is spread to everyone. Yeah. It's now there's fewer people who have lower levels of misery. The average level of misery has dropped for everyone. Yes. But it's not like, oh, misery was spread upon equally. No, no, no. You look before those revolutions, you look 200 years ago, misery was on everyone. <laughs> like, you wouldn't want to be a the, the top 0.1% 0, 0, 0, 0. 500 years ago, because they were far more miserable than the average poor person in whatever society you're probably listening to this. I, some places that maybe, maybe it might be worse. In Kenya, I'm trying to think like the poorest people here. Yeah, okay. So maybe the poorest people in Kenya right now <laughs> have worse life. Even the poorest of the poor in the United States of America, they would have worse life. But but still, like we just recently saw something, 25 people in a vehicle in, mm -hmm. in, in, in 25 people, 25 people in an expedition got T-boned by, by truck. Mm. People were thrown out of the vehicle. 13 people died on site. Um, but like a lot of people were injured, but those people were illegally in the United States of America. So you might think United States of America is a horrible country, but what were these people ex escaping for them to think will actually pile 25 of us in this vehicle with ripped out seats and risk this travel, get hit by that car. And you say, okay, people die without health care and these better things. But those people were still airless. Some people were airlifted. Some people were taken hostels. They're getting health care. No matter how messed up the system is and all these costs yeah. and things like that, they're getting health care in order to try to do something, whether it's illegal, yes, but why would they be trying to enter the United States of America if the United States of America was a, was a crap place? It's not a yeah. crap place. It can do better, but at the same point, if these people had decided, let's use a more legal process, in those messed up legal processes that do exist that I think can improve, would they have been there in that vehicle, in that position? That's why there's still some rules, there's still some laws. There's, there's, there's still, there's a lot of things to improve on, but it's definitely not as horrible as I think some people might might make it to seem in most places where you'd be listening to this from, from me listening to, seeing who listens to this kind of content. I think that's my my final rant. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, just had, I just had a few points to make. Um, I think of that analogy that came up in cynical theories about using the master's tools to tear down the master's house. That was Audre Lorde. I think her name was a black feminist. And she was criticizing reason and logic because the idea is that these are white man's tools used to uphold the white man's status. Now, what Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay said that was very good, I thought, was that the master's house is a good place to live. There's nothing wrong with the master's house. The problem is not everyone has access to the master's house. Destroying the master's house and leaving a pile of rubble that we all have equal access to doesn't benefit anyone. And that's what I you I thought of just now what you said about sharing misery. We shouldn't want to share misery. We should want to eliminate misery for everyone, get to a point where, as we already have, where what's misery today was would have been luxury how many years ago, and then in the future, fewer and fewer of those problems will exist. That's I That's ideal, not okay, well, rich people should have misery too. Well, poor people should continue to have misery. No, no, you want to eliminate it for everyone. That's what I thought. And then I said on the show, I think with Adam Patrick, how something like this repressive tolerance, I don't think every woke SJW has gone out and read this. I think they got some version of this distilled down to them in an you know easy to understand way. And they're sort of continuing the ideas, but they didn't actually go out and read this. And also too, like you said, a lot of people are passive. Like people say things like, "Oh, if I had lived during slavery, I would have fought against the slave owners." All that. No, you wouldn't. You're taking, you're taking, you're taking the safest option possible because you know, put, putting out a BLM sign and virtue signaling about how against racism you are is going to get you approval. You would not be going breaking onto plantations, freeing slaves, leading uprisings. Come on, you're not. You don't have those kind of balls. No. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think I'll just go back here to read to make sure, because I think that was the main point I was making if I was misreading him here. He says, with all the qualifications of a hypothesis based on a quote-unquote open. So by that quote-unquote, is he saying it's not open? Maybe that's what he was saying. Maybe he's saying it's not open. It's open historical record. It, it seems that the violence emanating from rebellion of the oppressed classes broke the historical continuum of injustice, cruelty, and silence for a brief moment. Brief but explosive enough to achieve... And increase achieve an increase in the scope of freedom and justice, 
and be a better and more equitable distribution of misery and oppression in a social in a new social system. You see, like that, that's what I'm saying. Like right there, you see. So he's saying it's an open with qualifications of a hypothesis based on an open historical record. So he's saying that it seems. So he's saying it seems. When he says seems, it does he mean it actually did or it didn't? So does he agree with this premise? So in one word, progress and civilization. So is he saying? In that status, that the English Civil Wars and the French uh, Revolution and the Chinese and Cuban revolutions may illustrate the hypothesis. He's saying may. Is he saying that they don't? Is he saying that they're not progress in civilization? Because I think civilization has progress, and I would not consider progress being a distribution of misery and oppression in a more equitable way to be a, a part of that progress. So, and again, this is what I'm saying. Like I am fallible. I haven't read this material. I might need to reread it. Maybe somebody will tell me a different kind of translation where he's saying, okay, he's saying it's not open. And he's saying he's mocking this as what people claim to be progress and suggesting that we need to do something else. If he's saying that, I kind of agree. I agree with that. But if he's saying, oh, no, this actually is progress and he's saying open, giving the hypotheses and saying, like, yeah, this stuff that he might not know because he's just admitting that and the stuff I might not know. And then, then I can, can see where he's coming from. But I don't think that whole aspect of spreading misery and oppression is something that I think was a positive thing of or, or positive or attributed to the English Civil Wars, the French Revolution, the Chinese and Cuban Revolutions. I don't think that's that's part of what came after that. I don't know. Yeah, again, I'm not well-versed enough on him where I can confidently say what he was arguing. Um, but I think with the misery thing, it's almost like how they view wealth. Like they always talk about redistributing wealth, not creating it. And that's what Thomas Sowell talks about. Like, you know, the way to cure poverty is just create more wealth. But they just talk about redistributing wealth. It's like, you know it's build more, create more pies, not divide up pies that are yeah. here further and further. And that, that, but that's how they're sort of looking at this too. Like, Oh, people are miserable. We have to somehow redistribute that. Not, we have to eliminate that, you know? So I, yeah, I think not, it's a miss it's a misframing of the situation. Yeah. We're not going to get into like peak freedom where we have to like ration the freedom and the Liberty around. It's like, there's enough freedom and Liberty yeah. for everyone. You don't have to like say, okay, everybody has to have a certain amount of misery and oppression. Yeah. That's, that's not how I think reality works. No. All right. So I think that's it. Yep. That's all I have. So yeah, that's it for me. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stephen, for having this. Thank now I'll be able to go and listen to other people. And many other people have been talking about this stuff. As Stephen mentioned, James Lindsay, I'll be able to now listen to what he said. Like I said, I just read this and I, I like talking these things over with friends. Stephen's one of my interlocutors or companions in these conversations. So we've done several of these. And uh, yeah, um, I think I'll just post this. It's going to be in about two and a half hours. But sure. I think all if right. you're... In this certain things, I know that I do clips of certain things, and when I'm we listen to this, there's certain conversation parts that I'll get some clips out of this, but I'll post this as one piece because I think anybody who's interested in an actual breakdown of <laughs> this kind of content would also be willing and able to sit down and listen to this and be able to choose and listen in whatever amount of sections that they want, whether they want to go 30 yeah. minutes by 30 minutes or find time to listen to it in a, in a row, put multiple time speed. I, th I think with this with this kind of content, I, there's definitely sections I'll be able to get smaller clips from. So, anything else you want to say to the yeah, people? Yeah, I think that I think that's a good idea. I was remarking to a friend. I myself do that with longer shows too. Like I break them into segments. I mean, nothing says you have to sit down for two hours. Do half an hour once. Do another half an hour. I mean, come back. I mean, the stuff's going to be here. It's not like you have to listen to it by mm -hmm. a certain time. So. Yeah. yeah, especially since we're going to like different sections, pages by pages. So yeah. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Come back soon. We're going to get, I'm, I'm going to be launching a new website soon, getting some things in the works. We will have a, maybe an audio version of this and it'll just be like a one place location to get many different things. There'll be links and things like that because I'm on Rumble now. I'm on, um, I'm on Rumble. I want to get some podcasting 2.0. I'm on like Odyssey, which is a library platform. I've, I've been trying to upload a bit shoot. It hasn't really been working, but I'll just get one location where I'm uploading our own stuff, the stuff that's in this network, and we're going to be expanding this. And Human Action is the next series coming up. That will be, I think, what I want that system set up and, and ready before we launch the Human Action series. But if that takes a bit longer than I thought, there's going to be other things that you mentioned. There was one thing uh, you'd said there was a good chance to have it as, as a document. It was something in, it was something that, was it? Matt Taibbi wrote something um, in of of like the press or something in defense. Oh, of the something. clubhouse coup. Is no, no, no. The... You, you wrote like in the, it was a great by Matt Taibbi or something in defense of the of people being able to 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 speak out and of media or something. I don't know. There's something in there. I'll, so, I'll find it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably find something else before the human action one. But I'll try my best to get the human action one out ready, probably by next weekend. <laughs> 
fingers crossed. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Just stay on for a bit longer after sure. we say bye to everyone. Sure. Bye, everyone. Thank you.